Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being streamed online through Microsoft Teams and broadcasted through BCPS TV, Comcast, X Comcast Xfinity, Channel 73, Verizon Files, Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the October 26th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Terminations. Any questions? Hearing none. Retirements. Questions? Let's continue. Resignations. Questions, please continue. Deceased recognition of service. Any questions? No, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So, so moved. moved. Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Assistant Principal, Powhatan Elementary School, Chief of Staff, Office of the Chief of Staff, and Manager, Enterprise Systems Management. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E-1? So, so moved. moved. Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? 
Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our first appointment. We can display the. Uh, Ms. Charlie Green, uh, Mildred Charlie Green, uh, as the Chief of Staff in the Office of Chief of Staff. Uh, she brings to us experience as the acting chief of staff. Also, she served as the executive director, secondary schools and the division of school support and achievement and previous experience as an administrator in Montgomery County Public Schools and the District of Columbia Public Schools. Congratulations, Ms. Charlie Green. Our next appointment. Go to the next slide, please. Yes, is Ms. Jocelyn Lear from Supervisor of Applications Administration and Support to the Manager of Enterprise Systems Management. She brings to us a lot of experience, 18.2 years of experience in Baltimore County, where she has served as a Supervisor of Applications Administrative and Support, Assistant Principal at Towson High School, Teacher of Physical Education at Towson High School, as well as Health as she participated in the Aspiring Leaders Program in 2008. Congratulations, Ms. Jocelyn Lear. <laughs> Next, we have Jessica K. Russo from the Teacher Staff Development from Pandonia International Elementary School to Assistant Principal at Powhatan Elementary School. She brings to us 12.2 years of experience she served as a staff development teacher, a stack teacher, and classroom teacher, all at Pandonia Ele International Elementary School. So congratulations, Jessica Russo. <laughs> that concludes the appointments. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies. And in light of the recommendations in the efficiency review concerning elimination and creation of senior positions, I move that policy 8364 be returned to PRC for further consideration of those changes and Dr. Williams' possible adjustment to the organization. Second, Causey. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend policy 8210, board officers, elections, and terms. Yes, Ms. Hen. Yes, I move to strike um, the following sentence from policy 8210. A person may not run for more than one position or office during an election. Second row. Okay, was moved and seconded. Um, any questions or any discussion? like to speak to it? Yes. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. The education article provides that any member of the membership may run for either position, chair or vice chair. This would place a restriction unnecessarily on the education article, precluding anyone from serving or from running for chair, from running for vice chair, um, in direct contradiction to the education article, which says that any member of the board may run for both offices um, unnecessarily and contradicting the education article by eliminating someone who runs for chair from being considered as part of the membership. Therefore, I believe by making this change to the policy, we are, would be, in effect, contradicting the education article, which allows any member of the board to run for both offices. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any more discussion? Yes, Ms. Rowe. So I agree with um, what Ms. Hen said, but also given how we do our elections and that we choose one office first, before we even choose the election of the people running for the next office, there's just no reason why 
a quorum of the board who selects one position should limit its own options in who should be able to be selected for the next position. So if a quorum of the board wants X person to be chair and a quorum of the board wants to consider someone who ran for chair to be vice chair, this puts an artificial constraint on the full board as to who they can choose by limiting the options for vice chair to exclude all people who were considered for chair. And I think that I don't understand as a practical matter why we would put ourselves under that sort of an artificial constraint. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Hager. Um, I just want to say that I agree that, and there aren't that many of us, and if two people you know, run for chair who really want to be in a leadership position and one wins and one doesn't win, then I would love to see them have the opportunity to run for vice chair because they clearly want to be a leader. And so I, I agree. I think it's artificial to, to remove that person from the, from the running. So. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So when I initially read this, I was putting it into the context of a general election where if you have someone run for president, they're not also going to run for vice president. Um, but I was just thinking that the way that we hold our, we conduct our elections on the board is that we don't necessarily have people running for a position. We nominate individuals to run for positions. And so just thinking of that, I, I, I feel as though like this could be used as a way, I'm not saying this board would use it that way, but couldn't we nominate everyone to be in a position and then not allow anyone to be vice chair? So I, I was just thinking of that just now and I feel like, you know, not that this board would do anything like that, but that that could be a conflict in future boards and policy is supposed to be like long lasting and eligible in any kind of circumstance. Oops. It's so time. thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, MABE has a policy review for equity for every policy should look through an equity lens. And uh, the main thing that you need to look at is will this policy have a positive impact on inclusion and full participation of people? And that's what this policy does is it includes more people. It goes from two people running to four people. It's inclusive. It's, it's helping people participate. And it's not just for this board. It's for all future boards as well when you're going through um, elections. Thank you. Any other Concern, uh, yes, um, Mr. Kuhn, I so, want to make sure I get members who haven't had a chance to speak. Yeah, just to clarify, more than two people can run for a position. So in essence, five people could run for chair, and then half the board would be unable to ride, run for vice chair. So again, it just doesn't make sense to me, and I, I won't be supporting it. I'll be supporting uh, Ms. Hen's motion to strike it. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll be supporting the motion in training that I attended at MABE. Um, there were several discussions about uh, the processes that different school districts around the state uh, used for their elections, and um, none of them had this restriction. And I think um, that this would limit um, participation. So I'm supporting the motion. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Just one final brief comment. As Mr. Thomas said, unlike the general election, we hold our multiple elections for each position back to back. So we do elect a chair followed by a separate election for vice chair. So it doesn't preclude anyone, unlike the general election, from running for both positions. They are separate elections. It's not as if someone's vote does not count. All votes are counted. And as Mr. Kuhn said, anyone, all members can run for both offices. So the argument that this somehow increases the equity or diversity of leadership positions is irrelevant. Anyone can be considered for both positions as the process and policy currently stands. There's no need for this. And certainly it limits the direct, um, it, it limits that rather than um, does what it's intended to do. So that's why my motion um, actually increases the, the equity and openness of the elections. Thank you. I have a follow-up. Yes, Ms. Jose. Thank you. Um, 
if Ms. Bressler or Ms. Howie could respond to Ms. Hen's query that this is illegal, I don't think it is. It doesn't go against Komar. language in uh, that statute indicates at the first meeting of the county board in December of each year, the county board shall elect a chair and vice chair from among the members. I did speak with uh, Mr. Brusades prior to um, this coming to the board and Mr. Brusades, when we spoke, did not see that the policy was illegal. It is not directly at odds with the state statute. The question is simply whether or not the board wishes to have this policy, and that's the question that's before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Yes, Mr. Offerman? I'll, I'll not be supporting this because I believe that we need to be more diverse in our, uh, in our, uh, in our leadership. And I believe if, if as a term, in, in terms of practicality, in the past three elections at least, almost every time people who ran for chair then would run for vice chair, or at least in, in several of those. And I think that we'll be stronger if we tap into the strengths of, uh, of different people on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Yes, Ms. Mack? Um, I will be supporting Ms. Hen's motion simply because um, this sentence does not make any sense. And again, I think we should celebrate the fact that if people want to run, the more people that run, the more opportunities um, the quorum has to pick the best leader and then to pick the best leader for vice chair. So I will be supporting Ms. Hen's motion. Yes, any other questions, concern? Yes, Ms. Hen. Yes, um, to state in case the public could not hear Ms. Howie, the um, 32B09 of the Education Code reads, at the first meeting of the county board in December of each year, the county board shall elect a chair and vice chair from among the members. I would like to ask Ms. Bressler to comment on the definition of members from that, to comment on whether the members is inclusive of all board members. Thank you. Madam Chair, could you please seek legal counsel for the definition of members? I'm a bit confused because I, uh, it seems self-explanatory what members means, members of the board. What legal counsel is it that you're... I would simply like Ms. Bressler to comment on what members means. A, a dictionary definition of what members means or... Legal counsel to define what members means. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm not clear, sure that I'm, I'm clear I'm, uh, on, on what we're getting, but if you could give her a Webster's definition, I guess, of what members means. I'm timing myself. Um, and I'm out of time. <laughs> Do I get excused there? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, normally in statutory interpretation, what a court would do is they would go to a dictionary to get a definition of members. I think the intent here is that, is that both the chair and vice chair have to be elected from, from members of the board. Uh, I, the procedure for doing that, and I think um, a, as uh, Ms. Howie said and, and as Eric Bersades said, the procedure for doing that, how from among the members of the board you run your election is up to the board. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, we are voting on the amendment to remove... Um, could you please restate your motion? Because I don't, I don't have it to restate it. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. My motion was to strike the language stating a person may not run for more than one position or office during an election. And that was seconded by Ms. Um, Ms. Rell. Thank you. Okay, so we're voting on the uh, motion to strike that language. And um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jose? No. 
Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor of seven. Okay, so that language is um, removed. Okay, so now, um, do I have a motion to accept policy 8210 as amended? So moved, Hen. Do I have a second? Second, Kuhn. Thank you. All right, Ms. Gover. Ms. Oh, excuse me, I apologize, Ms. Pastor. Can I hear the motion now minus the part that was removed? I, don't, I, 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 don't, I can't hear you. Either. May I hear the motion minus the piece that was removed? The motion was to remove the language to limit a board member from running for more than uh, one position or office during the election. Right, we already voted on that. Yes, so now we're voting on policy 8210. And, and that is, you wanna know what policy that is? I wanna hear it now, because that piece was removed. I wanna hear it. That's the whole policy. Okay, so that says policy um, 8210 is board officers, elections, and terms of office. I'll read the whole, whole thing. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation uh, to amend, that was the original one, to amend policy 8210 board officers' elections in terms of office. Okay. So Ms. Hen okay. made a motion to amend it. So we voted on the amendment. Now we're voting on the policy 8210 as amended. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Ms. Mack. If I look at the policy then, is the only change the word and in line 21, section three? What line is it that you're pulling it from? I'm pull I pulled it from lines 13 and 14. It was pulled from lines 13 and 14? Right, so I'm just trying to clarify what, with the exception, with, when, with that out, what else is being changed and I, what Nothing else is being changed. 23. Line 23 is adding the word and. Is that, the ch is that basic, no? The, ch the capitalizations and yeah. some conventions. I guess I'm wondering with that being stricken, mm -hmm. are there any changes that are being made to this policy? That's what I'm I trying can to get clarity let on. Let Ms. Howie answer that it's if she could because The word and is being removed, but it's being placed after the word secretary. And there are capitalizations that follow uh, what the PRC requires in terms of standardization, but there are no other content changes. So just to be clear, Ms. Howie, when we vote to, to send this to second reader, we're really voting on the word and. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify for our public that um, the vote is to approve policy 8210 to be moved forward as amended to second reader. That is correct. Thank you. That is correct. Thank you. And then also for our public, um, we may have had um, members of the public sign up to speak uh, comments on policy 8210 and 8364. Um, and I'd like to request that any um, members that did um, sign up to make comments on policies 8210 and 8364 that the board would still hear them? Yeah, that, hasn't. that hasn't changed. It's on the agenda in board docs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was not ever removed. Um, any more questions? Okay. Are we ready for the vote? Okay, Ms. Gold, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. 
Ms. Pasteur? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Doc, uh, Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers were selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's um, website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. So it is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments, but it does not look like we have any. So um, we will start with our stakeholders, and our first speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Workload again, the same but very different. When school started and we were back in our classrooms, we knew it wasn't back to normal. The pre-pandemic normal wasn't good for educators or, stu or students, and this new normal, or whatever we're calling it, isn't good either. The routines and structure of what it means to be in a classroom had to be retaught. Many students are struggling to get back into a regular schedule, even two months into this school year. Students have always brought not only their academic needs to our classroom, but their mental health, emotional, and physical needs too. And our educators have done all they can to meet those needs, but they are greater than ever before. The workload and the expectations for our educators is not sustainable, especially with the unfilled positions that we have affecting our school system. I hear from administrators, teachers, support professionals, and families. There are students who just don't have buses to get them. Parents are asked regularly to provide transportation. Students don't have their additional adult supports. Paraeducators and resource teachers are being pulled for coverage and to cover recess duty. And our educators are doing many coverages because there just isn't enough staff. And I know BCPS is reaching out and it's a national problem, but none of that is helping our educators as they work with our students. What do we do while we are searching for and hiring staff? What can be done to make our educators feel supported and to be sure that the work they are being asked to do is absolutely essential? 
We want our educators to develop relationships with students and then we take away the precious time they need to do this. This year, more than ever before, the relationships are taking longer to form and many students are struggling. If our students aren't available for learning for whatever reason, and our educators don't take the time to address that, no amount of PD, PLCs, objectives, SLOs, or any other type of instruction will matter. The needs of our students have grown and we need to be sure we are addressing them. But let us not forget the educators as well. We tell them to be sure they are taking care of themselves and their families, but are we really following the words with actions? Or are we piling on another task, another PD, another meeting? Every single task simply cannot be essential. What can we take off their plates? Please work with us to find a way to help our educators so they can help our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carter Bohart from BCSC General. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Dr. Williams, student member of the Board Thomas, and other esteemed board members. My name is Carter Bohart, and I am the Community Outreach Director of the Baltimore County Student Councils, and I will be reporting on the activities of the Baltimore County Student Councils and the Baltimore County Junior Council, our new middle school counterpart. Since our last report, the BCSC and BCJC committees met for their first time. Our committees for the year are the Environmental Infrastructure, General Services, Diversity and Equity, and SMOB Outreach Committee, all tasked with advising the BCSC and BCJC surrounding the areas at which they are assigned. Each committee took time to introduce each other, brainstorm ideas, and begin their work towards a full year of hard work and great success. Tomorrow, BCSC and BCJC will be holding its fall camp event virtually for many schools across the county. And as I sit here, our officers are hard at work preparing last minute details. We have spent months carefully preparing presenters and activities for our students. Because of COVID-19, we have opted for an in-person school field trip, sending a box of materials to each school so that they may participate in interactive leadership activities. Our theme for this year is resilience, glowing through the dark where we will hold workshops to teach our students that even through the roughest times in life, we can use our voices and our talents to break through any barrier. We are excited to begin our Board of Selected Students, or how we like to call it, BOSS, in November. BOSS is a space where students from across the county, those in SGA and other clubs and organizations, can come together to share ideas surrounding events, important and prevalent student issues, and more. This time will also allow for our BCSC and BCJC regional representatives to reach out to their schools in their region and form strong relationships. Lastly, at our next executive board meeting, the BCSC executive board will vote on a piece of legislation, our platform, which will be in support of CDC guidelines and school systems and their support to initiate and prevent the spread of COVID-19 within school environments while promoting education, extracurriculars, and the opportunities for our students to thrive in their school environments. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bash Farone from the Central AEAC. Good evening to all. Our council is still concerned about us not really having access to teachers, parents, and students to let them know of our activities. Also, they are really concerned that things do not move fast enough and quote, it's the red tape. Um, last but not really least, uh, the members are very eager to hear from the board and administration in relation to our uh, recommendation to expand the student exchange program and the foreign languages of G7 plus Chinese, Arabic, Persian, Urdu for the economic and the cultural benefits. I would like to let you know that November 3rd is our next meeting and we have two excellent speakers. The topic is about the curriculum 
It will be held in Mays Chapel Elementary School. And the title is School Curriculum. How is it made? Is it rigorous enough to meet the challenges of the future? And does it adequately and fairly include the other languages, history, and culture beyond Europe and the Americas? Does the curriculum include an effective effort to shape the future of our students away from racial and ethnic bias? We have two excellent speakers. Ms. Megan Shea is the Director of Academics, and Ms. Jennifer Hernandez is the Director of ESOL and World Languages. I really welcome you all to our meetings. I hope you come. I did ask you last time for money for cookies and drinks. <laughs> it helps. Um, but I really I invite all public and this is the reason why we ask you for permission to access teachers, parents, and students. If we cannot have the access, how can we really advertise? So if anybody really wants any for more information, my name is on the web. My cell phone is on the web. My email is on the web. I'll be glad to give you any explanation. I really thank you for attendance. Thank you. Next is Marlena Purcell, the Southwest AEAC. Good evening. Do I start? Okay. Chair Scott, Vice Chair, and board members, Dr. Williams, um, and BCPS community. It's my pleasure to be here tonight like the code, <laughs> um, but it is my pleasure um, as a chair of the Southwest Area Advisory, Educational Advisory Council, um, I'm just going to use this time to provide advocacy for a few schools um, that was mentioned in our area that desperately needs some capital budget money consideration. Um, we know that uh, decisions have been made by this board already, and whenever and if, when, the money comes available. Um, I would like the board to consider um, the Southwest area, specifically these three schools, Featherbed Elementary, in terms of the entrance into the school, Woodward, Woodbridge Elementary School, in terms of their permanent walls situation right now, their open space school. Um, the third is reducing the overcrowdedness in the Catonsville area, um, perhaps renovating the Arbutus Elementary School too. Um, I know that with the time that I have left, I just wanted to indicate the recent concerns in our area that were expressed at our second Monday, 7 p.m. October meeting, um, well attended by the way, um, which three I'm going to leave you tonight. It's a flagpole repair and maintenance of all schools. Two, um, at Southwest Academy specifically, um, there needs to be a clear and defined drop-off system. If you ever go on Johnny Cake in the morning, you'll understand the stop and go and perhaps missing children as they cross the street. So we just want to continue to advocate for that. And the third that I want to leave you tonight, which was a concern at the October meeting, of course, we all hear about needing other bus drivers and teachers, but we also want to include the nurse, the nurse staff. We would hate to have any um, health center closed down because of um, uh, tracking and not being able to have our students have whatever needs that they need for that day because the nurses need to do that. Um, as I conclude, I would like to inform all stakeholders, parents, and and community that our next meeting is Monday, November 8th, 7 p.m. It is on Zoom. Your child's principal is responsible for sending the notices. It is also on the website. Likewise, I would just want to give a shout out and a public thanks to Dr. Raquel Jones for all of her support and presence in the West Zone and whatever it is that Dr. Williams you do in terms of reducing or taking away or whatever the case may be, the parents do appreciate having 
to go to one person. Thank you. Thank you. Next is John Clark from AFSME. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Williams and uh, members of the board. My name is John H. Clark, proud school bus operator with Baltimore County Public Schools for the, for the last 12 years and newly elected vice president of Ask Me Local 434. Here with permission and on behalf of President Brian Epps, where we represent all Ask Me workers who support the critical infrastructure of our school system. Our work helps to ensure that the system lives up to its vision and goals, which we fully support. And the dedicated workers I, I mentioned push every day to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare our students for a brighter future. That is the reason that myself, members of Ask Me Local 434, our sisters and brothers of other bargaining units, and everyone in attendance is here today. The pandemic has impacted nearly all elements of our lives and has only exacerbated the ongoing staffing issue. We are here today to bring three calls to action to the board. Number one, the system needs to address the ongoing staffing shortages by supporting workers through the processes that come with pre-employment. Uh, this can be done by streamlining and improving the onboarding process. Number two, our members can do the work. The board should make positions more attractive and long-lasting places of employment, thus enabling the removal of contractors from our school facilities, which is tantamount to nothing more than a stopgap measure that does nothing to address the shortages of staff that we see in our schools today. Last but not least, we call for a fair and livable wage by paying all newly hired employees at least $15 an hour and adjusting the salaries of present employees accordingly to meet the rising costs associated with the present cost of living, inflation, and our changing economy. Many of our actions we, call, we are calling for are, uh, are contained within the Baltimore County Public Schools Operational and Efficiency Review Report released this past September. As our members have supported the mission of BCPS, we will continue to do our jobs to make a more efficient and effective system. All of our Ask Me members have been on the front line since March 13, 2020. And when schools and offices were closed, Ask Me members were the only ones who were required to be here in our buildings. We thank Chief Administrator and Operator, Operations Officer Dr. Uh, Brian Scrivens for his leadership and commitment to supporting the most important resource of our system, the faculty and staff. We thank you for your time and look forward to working towards solutions to the ongoing challenges thank we you. currently face. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Danita Tolson. And I'd ask everyone, uh, whether you're speaking or seated, to um, please maintain a mask. Good afternoon. Good evening, Chairwoman um, Scott, Vice Chair Hinn, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I am the Baltimore County Branch NAACP NAACP president. This board selected Dr. Williams in 2019, 18, excuse me, eight months into his first year on the job at a time when a new superintendent should be attending or uh, acquainting himself with his new job and colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic forced the closure of the Baltimore County Public Schools for the remainder of the school year. The schools halted in-person learning and switched to completely virtual learning. Face-to-face -face instruction resumed during the global pandemic. The Baltimore County NAACP concerns are 
the students' education, providing COVID safety for the students, the teachers, staff, parents, and athletes, and to provide adequate bus transportation for our students. There are more and more kids contracting COVID, and unfortunately, there is no COVID vaccine for kids under 12 years old. During the last board meeting, individuals discussed Dr. Williams did not deserve an award that was presented by the NAACP. I'm here for everyone to hear my voice that Dr. Williams did deserve the award. Please hear my voice. We, the NAACP, will continue to support Dr. Williams. It leads me to wonder what is being focused on. We achieve more when we work together. I look to believe, I like to believe that we can move forward to focus more on the curriculum, allowing African American history to be taught, and providing new schools for communities that show inequality of getting resources to ensure our students are successful. This board and community should be focused on real solutions during these COVID challenges for all Baltimore County communities. There is a lack of equal learning experiences for black and brown students and underperforming schools across the system. The Baltimore County NAACP look forward to continue conversations involving more moving forward to provide equal and balance in the Baltimore County. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Next is Inez Tate Franklin from ESPBC. Good evening, Dr. Williams, to the chair, to the vice chair, to the board. My name is Inez Franklin. I am a paraeducator who serves as an ESPBC board of director. I am speaking this evening on behalf of Jeanette Young, our president, and the education support professionals of Baltimore County. I am positive that you heard the voices outside of the window. They were educators from a variety of positions asking you to work with us to remedy the staffing crisis that is harming the students and staff. As a paraeducator, I work with fifth grade students. My classroom is normally staffed with two adults to meet the intense needs of students. Because of the staffing shortages, I am often pulled from that classroom and those students to support a classroom where there is no adult to staff the room. I am not an exception. There are many paraeducators, interpreters, and even office professionals who are putting their primary job responsibilities on the back burner to support the immediate need of students. Now, I want to be clear. I understand that we are here for the students. At this point, we are prioritizing the needs of students and neglecting the needs of many of them for one reason. We do not have enough people to do the job. I have been watching the last few board meetings and am aware that you are reviewing the recommendations of the Baltimore County Operational Efficiency Review Report. As you continue to look at and implement the recommendations, I implore you to streamline the onboarding process. I have heard of employees who wait over a month to complete the onboarding process. During that time, they are expected to pay for their own fingerprinting and physicals. By covering the costs of applying to BCPS, the employees are in debt. BCPS should pay for the fees associated with the onboarding process. End subcontracting. Over the years, I have worked with BCPS. I have seen numbers of contracted employees increase exponentially. The contractors are then in one of two categories. They are using BCPS as a stepping stone to a permanent position, or they are connected to the system and hope that one day they will become permanent. Either way, those positions are a strain on the permanent positions by 
decreasing our FTE allocation. Instead of reducing our FTEs, end subcontracting and make the positions permanent bargaining unit positions. Restructure the pay scale. Another reason we cannot attract and retain high quality employees is that people can work outside of education and make more money for doing comparable work. Instead of assuming that the teachers are the only employees it's time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is general public comment. And our first speaker is Darren Bedillo. Good evening. My name is Darren Badillo. I'm a concerned parent of two students who go to PCPS, um, and I'm an advocate uh, for our community. Um, you know, I was having a conversation um, with the vice president of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition after the last board meeting, and you know, Dr. Williams, Makita Scott, and Board of Education, you know, we're not against you. Um, we're not against any board member. Um, we just want what's best for our children. It's obvious with the issues going on in our school, as obvious there's issues in our schools. You had the 200 kids walk out of Patapsco High School. This past week you had 400 kids walk out of Dundalk High School. We have major issues going on in Baltimore County schools and I appreciate some of the speakers today talking. Um, and with the short staff school system that we have with teachers, our children are being let down and not getting the prop, their education is not up to par. Also, a major issue I'm hearing with parents and students is it starts with holding people accountable. We have kids in school, repeat offenders, pushing the boundaries to see how much they can get away with, disrupting classrooms, slowing down learning, and putting more unnecessary stress on our teachers. How would you feel if your child was punched, intimidated, harassed, or sexually assaulted? I was excited to learn that Maryland, that leaders were getting together up this past week to talk about our children's safety. Then I was disappointed to learn that you were talking about giving the BCPS students the vaccine. We have bigger issues going on in our county, low reading levels, low math levels, the teacher shortage going on. We have parents who feel they have nowhere to turn, no process to address their concerns or issues. I wanted to ask you guys, I don't know if you can reply back, but what does a parent do if their child is being intimidated, bullied, or harassed? Is there a form that they can fill out? And what is that form called? Can somebody tell me? Is it the bullying intimidation form? This that's, is your time. To okay, speak. that's the form. Okay. So they fill it out, get to the schools, and the school's supposed to get back to them. And I want to share one last thing with you. I have a, a, a parent share something and say, Darren, who do, I, who do you recommend I reach out to regarding the BCPS transportation issues? I called my daughter's school and spoke to the transportation superintendent, and I'm not getting answers. My daughter's, my daughter's bus stop was missed two days in a row, and finally when, I, when they came, I called them today, they sent a bus to pick her up. Being an hour late, my 13-year-old daughter was standing on a bus stop alone for an hour. Also, another student was also left there with her. That parent brought her to school and was told that she was going to get an unexcused tardiness because she brought them to school. How is that fair? We got to do better. Let's come together. That's time. Next we have Sharon Seroff. Good evening. The last time I spoke on public comment, I introduced you to three important words that are the centerpieces of special education. FAPE, free and appropriate public education, IEP, individualized education plan, and LRE, least restrictive environment. I then proceeded to tell you how BCPS is falling short on providing those three important items. 
Unfortunately, the situation is getting better, is it getting worse and not better. There are students not receiving services such as speech and language therapy because a therapist is not available to their school. There are students not receiving home and hospital services because there are not enough tutors. And there are students whose needs aren't being met because their home school simply does not have the staff or services to support them. But I'm not here to complain. I'm here to suggest some solutions. One, offer a continuum of special education services in the virtual environment. This way you can provide special education services to any student in their least restrictive environment. Provide students in quarantine and who are absent with virtual tutors. Virtual tutoring and special education services were provided last year. We can do it again. Look at e the needs of each individual student before we push them into a harmful environment, because that's what we're doing right now. Give teachers more time to plan the services they need to provide and the content they need to teach. No teacher or support staff should be at a school building at 9 p.m. or on a weekend to plan a lesson or address parent concerns, and they are there till that point. We need to admit to our mistakes, BCPS. We need to take responsibility for those mistakes and learn from them. I have a motto. If at first you don't succeed, try another way. It's time to try another way, a better way. The future of our students is at stake. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mary Taylor. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Scott, Dr. Williams, Board of Education members. My name is Mary Taylor. I'm here representing the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. And once again, it's very concerning to us that the Board of Education does not have academic achievement on the agenda this evening. We've taken the time to look at the highlight page for each of the 175 schools within Baltimore County Public Schools in 2018 to 2019. The last year data was compiled. I have a printout if any of the board members are interested in seeing it. I will lay it right there. Many schools are reporting extremely low number of students who are meeting the 61% proficiency rate in English and math. What actions is the curriculum department taking to provide teachers with materials and trainings that will effectively teach the majority of students and raise proficiency rates across all schools. Here is the data for two of the schools recently highlighted by the superintendent and the board, and I spoke of this two weeks ago. The year of 2019, Deer, Deer, Deer Park Magnet Middle School had a 25% proficiency rate in English and a 12% proficiency rate in math. And for Scott's Branch Middle School in 2018 to 19, they only had a 13% proficiency rate in English and a 17 proficiency rate in math. So at these two highlighted schools, 75% or more of our kids are not at the 61 proficiency rate in English and 83 or more of them are not at the 61 proficiency rate in math. So let's focus on overall achievement in each level of school for 2018 to 2019. In math, elementary students are only 36.8% proficient. Middle school students are only 23.9% proficient. And then high school students actually increased, but only increased to 36.4%. 
In English language arts, elementary students are 40%, middle school students are 35.7%, and high school students are 51.3 proficient. Our graduation for 2018-2019 is 89%. How can 89% kids graduate when only 36.4% and 51.3% are only proficient in math and ELA? Now that was the data before the pandemic and a whole year of COVID and virtual learning. Can only imagine how the prolonged closures of our schools have now affected the students' education. It's a question many parents are worried about and we are hoping BCP is going to offer a clear picture of a plan and raise our proficiency rates. Thank you for the opportunity this evening. Thank you. Next is Amy Adams. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board, and Dr. William. I'm here tonight to bring up a few topics that are very important to students and parents, but not on tonight's agenda. First, transportation. The issues continue. In Dr. William's presentation on September 28th, related to the efficiency report, he mentioned three actions to address the transportation issues, a job fair, compensation, and a data dashboard. I've seen the advertisements for jobs, but what's the status of compensation and where is the data dashboard located for parents to use? When a driver is out, there is no communication from the schools to the parents about the lack of service for the day. Please update us. Second, student and staff safety related to school violence. Yes, across the country, there seems to be an uptick in violence in schools. It is occurring in our schools. Two local high schools staged walkouts recently and talked to the administration at their school. Was there a new plan of action to address their concerns? Families contact me almost every day to share their experience with violent incidents in our schools. Their kids are scared to return. This is an urgent matter that needs attention and communication. Third, the vaccination requirement for student athletes. If you're concerned about public health and safety, why single out one group of students? On the agenda for tonight is the presentation of reading instruction and curriculum used in BCPS. I look forward to hearing the details. From what's on the PowerPoint, it looks amazing. I'm really excited about what the curriculum department is doing, but it seems they're working in a silo. Until progress is monitored in actual classrooms, it doesn't seem to be affecting our years of low proficiency rates specifically. What is the curriculum's department authority to ensure what is presented here is happening in all BCPS schools? My understanding based on the organization chart, they don't have authority. It seems like a huge waste of money and time to purchase quality materials and programs that aren't being implemented properly. I would think if we're using evidence-based strategies in every classroom for all curriculum, we would see results because the evidence base is there to show the program or methodology of teaching actually works but our data is not showing improvements, and in some cases, it's showing regression. We absolutely need more accountability and a different way of managing professional development. Right now, based on questions asked recently at board meetings and curriculum committee meetings about professional development, there seems to be no answers, no accountability to fidelity, no tracking, and no follow-up. What can be done to ensure that the implementation of these programs reach the students and benefits them? Staff has recently spent a significant amount of time at multiple meetings on an equity poster rather than focusing on equity, equity and academic achievement. Children that are not on grade level in reading cannot be at grade level on anything. If the measure of success in equity work is a poster, we are all in trouble. Thank you. Next is Erica Ma. It's nice to be back here in person, and even better to be in the classrooms with students. My name is Erica Ma, and I'm here as a BCPS parent, a community member, an elementary school teacher, an advocate for ESOL students, and a member of TABCO. I'm here to say that we are not just now in a staffing crisis situation. We've been heading towards this crisis for years, decades perhaps. I witnessed this since my daughter's first day of kindergarten with 29 children and one shared aid between all K teachers and my son's fourth grade math class with 37 students. 
and now there are high school classes which average over 30 students in an overcrowded building. As an elementary school teacher and TABCO member, I see and hear about it every day. We have an ESOL population that has increased nearly 2,500 students this year, yet we have the same staff as last year. Special education teachers are handling twice their caseloads. Schools have inadequate OT or SLP services. Schools are short-staffed, forcing teachers and support staff to do extra coverages. Schools need more than a dozen AAs, IAs, and AAAs to be one-on-one -on -one for students, to support teachers with small groups, and to make it work day-to-day. -day. And nurses. There are truly no words to describe how overworked they are. But wait. Most mornings, we can't even teach on time, because bus drivers are doing two to three runs for less than a living wage. And why would anyone want to come to work for BCPS right now? Teachers are still waiting for fixes to their payroll and reimbursements for nearly a year because payroll is also understaffed. Teachers are given more and more duties that have nothing to do with the actual teaching of st students. AAs and IAs can be given a contract on time with a living wage or a promise of continued employment. ESPBC members are more than support staff. They are the backbone of our county. They help create teaching conditions for teachers that can decide whether or not students can learn to the best of their ability. Right now, the staffing conditions, or lack thereof, are profoundly affecting our ability to teach and students' ability to learn. This is not new. It is not because of the pandemic. This has been building up for years, and administration after administration had chosen to ignore the problems or put a Band-Aid on it. They depended on the fact that teachers stay for their students. But at what point does our mental health override our love for students? What point do our families override our passion for teaching? And at what point does our physical health make it impossible for us to support our students? For many, that time has come, and for many more, the time is rapidly approaching. So the question for this administration is, are you willing to be the solution? A solution to this problem that we needed a $1.2 million efficiency study to confirm what advocates, parents, and teachers have been saying for years, that we need more people in the schoolhouse. I keep hearing the metaphor that we're in the same boat. While our teachers' boats, our student boats, our support staff boats are sinking, and we've been patching up these boats for years and are out of materials, are you going to give us the staffing to rescue the teachers and students? We desperately need it now. Next is Edward Herrera. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, my name is Edward Herrera, uh, father of uh, four young children. We're zoned to Harford Hills uh, Elementary School. Um, I'm speaking with you all this evening to advocate uh, that all children in Baltimore County uh, who do receive um, an IEP for uh, speech are able to receive those speech services through Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, what I found uh, is that um, speech services are available to students of Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, they're available to students of private schools, parochial schools, uh, but they aren't available uh, to families that homeschool their children. Um, I've tried to reach out to Child Find, who those services are available through. I've reached out to Baltimore County Special Education, Educational Options, Educational Opportunities, uh, Hartford Hills Elementary School, who's been exceptionally supportive, uh, and no one has been able to provide for me a reason why these services have been removed for homeschooling families. Um, so I'm here this evening uh, hoping, uh, pleading that you will provide uh, those services uh, to homeschooling families as you do provide for every other child in Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bash Verone. You may have noticed the shortage of computer chips 
and other products, and that's because the world is diverse and reliant on each other. We are also in Baltimore County diverse of multiple nationalities, ethnicities, and faith. So I go back to 1996. I asked Dr. Berger at that time to include the Muslim holidays as of equal to the Jewish holidays. He agreed and promised, but when it came to the board, he advocated for his own faith holiday. In 2004, 2005, two honorable members, Michael Kennedy and Nicholas Camp, student member Nicholas Camp, supported our bid for equality. But the majority did not, as they feared the pressure from outside. Past board member Michael Collins, who used to sit in the middle on the left side, asked why the Muslim holidays are not equal to the Jewish holidays. The calendar committee over many years had always lame reasons to prevent us from having equality of holidays. Just like the lame reason that they gave to you to why they want to start before Labor Day. Because some families want to have their kids have head up on their athletics. We never really seen anybody ask for that. We have no data on it, just a reason. I'd like to honor Ms. Romaine Williams, past board, board member and PRC chair, who really supported our bid and held a meeting in relation to that. The community came in and filled all this room and all the hallway outside, asking for equality. Mr. Bowler was a past board member who came here and advocated for equality. Mr. Moniades, who used to sit on this side, did the same thing. And Councilman McIntyre came in in a wheelchair and supported our bid for equality. All what I'm asking, please make it clear. Two equals two, one equals one, zero equals zero every year. No ifs, no buts. We want to be equal. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Mohammed Jamil. Peace be with you all. Education is what raises the intellect of human beings. There are two sources that determine the character of every man. The academic knowledge which is given to him and the societal environment that is the breeding ground of his behavior. Deficiency in either sources creates bias and prejudice against one another. History is a branch of knowledge that records and explains the past. The omission or the exaggeration of some facts nurtures the sense of superiority of one over the other. Researchers of today have discovered that Asian people called Indians came to America during the Ice Age 15,000 years ago or earlier. The Scandinavian pirates called Wikinger in Scandinavian language came 1,200 years ago. These Vikings represented themselves as traders and explorers, but they were the ones who were the savages, raiding civilized nations, monasteries, as warriors for treasure and women. West African country Mali was a Muslim empire from 13th to the 17th century. It carried out exp expeditions across the Atlantic. Two of their three ships were wrecked in Cape Hatteras. 
The Muslim sailors settled in North Carolina, married into the Indian tribes 760 years ago. European colonization began 530 years ago. Columbus, the brutalities that he committed in his conquests and treatment of the natives is left out from most of the textbooks. According to Professor Fernando Branco, Columbus's own writings and the biography written by his son, Ferdinand Columbus, indicates that he was of Portuguese origin. His navigator was a Muslim who used the travel records of the Muslim Ottoman Empire. Columbus was associated with French privateers and offered his services to Spanish queen. 10 million of the 80 million surviving kidnapped persons as slaves in the 18th century included 3 million Muslims who were forced to convert to Christianity or be killed. Muslims in America is not a new phenomenon. Their history has been whitewashed and gave rise to biases and prejudice against them. It took over 30 years of struggle in BCPS to get the recognition three years ago for Muslim students. Today we fear that the period is, that period is being wiped out and the discriminatory practices of the unequal treatment is being restored. Please do not compromise their welfare, reinstate their societal educational interest. By the way, Columbus is being investigated by British historians. We rewrite the history of... As if they only invented the... Thank you. The traffic signal or... Yes. Or it's time, Mr. Jamal. Thank, thank you. you. Next is Brian Prue. Not here? Okay. All right, and next is public comment on policy 8210, board officers, election and terms for office. And our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Sarah. Okay, thank you. Go to the next speaker. Next speaker is Miss Mary Taylor. Madam Chair, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt the meeting, but Mr. Pro wanted to let you know that he was in attendance this evening, and he did want to speak, but he had to leave. And I'd like to thank the uh, board and Madam Chair and Vice Chair for the opportunity to speak tonight on Policy 80 to 10, Board Officer Elections and Terms. I'm just a little confused by the rotation on the board agenda. I would think that public comment about board policy before it's b voted on would be more appropriate than asking public comment after the policy was voted on. It just seems like it makes it to the public that our comments are not warranted or welcomed. So I'm not sure who sets the policy, but I'm sorry, Miss Taylor, be nice you have to, to speak able about to the policy. I am, ma'am. Okay. Um, I read the education article. 32B09, and it calls for the election of officers from the membership. So any board member can be nominated or self-nominated for the chair and vice chair position. All Board of Education members vote on this. So why is there a need to amend and apply restrictions? I'm slightly confused. Why should anyone who is willing to serve in one leadership position be denied the opportunity to pursue another if not chosen for the first. The reason I heard when I listened to the PCR meeting was given by Ms. Joes, who proposed this change was to diversify the board, but anyone is eligible, so how does this amendment change anything in actuality? All nominations and voting for vice chair are independent of nominations 
and voting for chair and all nominations, voting for both offices count, regardless of the outcomes of each. So only the new elected chair cannot run for vice chair. So my question is, what would the unattended consequences of this change be? Thank you. Next is Mr. Bash Farone. This is for policy 8210. Line number five. Uh, I recommend that the candidates for chair and vice chair shall present to the members and to the public before election their vision, mission, and plans to accomplish if elected. Line number 23, superintendent presiding over elections. I don't know the origin of this. It might be Komar, I just think the board lawyer is more appropriate one because superintendent has vested interest on who is the chair and who is the vice chair. I just think it's just too much of an effect. I also recommend that the chair and the vice chair running for elections to make their election interest known two months before elections. We need time as public to hear you and to listen to you. I also like to, su to suggest to you that both chair and vice chair needs to clearly pledge in public that they s stand to respect and implement the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, the Maryland State Constitution, and all other statutes, codes, and policies of the county and the federal government. Furthermore, the chair and vice chair shall affirm that they will always place the best interest of all students in their debates, actions, or decisions. Those are my recommendations. I hope you would consider. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I sit for the next one or? Um, yes, next comment. Next is public comment on policy 8364, financial disclosure statements. And um, our first speaker was uh, Sharon Seraf. It looks like she has gone. So now it's Mr. Bash Farone. Mr. Farone, it's your turn. Ms. Seraf has left. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. My hearing is not as good. I'm sorry, just one second, I, I lost it. <laughs> Madam Chair, this policy is lengthy. May I have four minutes? Okay. Now you get three minutes. <laughs> okay, good evening. Line item 20 to 23. It talks about office hours, reasonable fees, and procedures established. My question is, 
and concern. Why come physically to BCPS office and inspect and copy? We are in 2021. Also, fees can be a burden. Time is scarce. I suggest that we use high technology to upload documents into secure email, like what accountants, lawyers, life insurance companies. I do ask you not to ask for fees. It is really burdensome and can be misused to avoid people asking for the correct information. Item number 28 and 29, home address, name of the requester and their home address. I think that can be a problem as far as a confidentiality of own residence and safety and security. Page number five, item line number four, retention requirement. I suggest that we go for 10 years or maybe longer. Our experience with Dr. Dance, it took a long time to figure out what he did or was doing, and I think four years is too short. Page number seven, item 10 to 19. Gift in excess of $20. If I ask a board member for a meeting and we go to McDonald's, it would be at least $15, close to 20. If you go to Panera Bread, it would be $20. That's reportable. I just need really a peaceful time to talk to a board member. I think $20 is just too strict in this day and age. Item number, page nine, item, I think, I'm not sure what it is, definition of interest. Yep, that's time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our public comment. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call on Ms. Bressler. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Vice Chair, Superintendent, members of the board. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session to decide appeals in cases HE 21-25, HE 21-26, and 22-02. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the votes taken in closed session, in public session now. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 21-25, 21-26 and 22-02. So, so moved. moved. Second Thank you. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Ms. Gover may have a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? <coughs> I'm sorry. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pressler. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on reading instruction and curriculum used in BCPS. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea, Ms. Kraft, and Mr. Wilson. So good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good evening. Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board. That was the test to make sure you were paying attention. Uh, tonight we have a presentation on reading instruction and the use of curriculum in BCPS. And our presenters are Dr. Mary Boswell McComas, our Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Megan Shea, our Executive Director of Academics, Mr. Eric Wilson, Executive Director in School Support and Achievement, and Ms. Jennifer Kraft, Director of, in the Office of English Language Arts. 
we are focusing on the very first focus area, learning accountability and results in our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence, and the second key initiative, which reads as follows. New curricula and elementary English language arts and mathematics in order to increase student achievement, it is critical to begin with a solid foundation for our youngest learners. Students and teachers must have access to high quality instructional materials aligned with the rigor of college and career ready standards to ensure equitable access to meeting and exceeding expectations in literacy and mathematics. We know the importance of reading and we are here tonight to discuss the written, taught, and, curriculum, and assessed curriculum related to reading in grades K through five and how the curriculum and instruction office and the Division of School Support and Achievement work together with our school leadership to monitor and support this work in our schools. We are happy to follow up with reading in our secondary schools as well as the written, taught, and assessed curriculum related to mathematics. However, tonight, we are strictly focusing on reading in grades K through five. Also, this presentation is aligned with the Board of Education goals. So our presenters are ready to begin. So uh, good evening, uh, members of our board and Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for the opportunity for our team to present this evening. As Dr. Williams said, we will be covering the written, taught, and assessed curriculum in detail for elementary school, as well as, as sharing with you exactly how uh, the Division of Curriculum and Instruction and the Division of School Support and Achievement work hand in hand to support our teachers and our schools. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McComas. Good evening, everyone. We are so happy to be here tonight to talk about a very important topic, um, reading, and we're gonna start tonight with our primary grades. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Williams just mentioned, this is a critical foundation to ensure that all of our students are able to access the rigor of the standards across every discipline. So I'm going to start tonight by unpacking what we're calling the five pillars of literacy. Some of you may remember we talked about this with our pipe cleaners, a curriculum committee, talking about the strands of literacy. But tonight what I want to help ensure is that we understand this foundation, how these elements of literacy are actually the foundation of all of our curriculum and the resources that we've identified. So I'm going to work from left to right to explain a little bit about these pillars because they serve as the foundation for everything else that we'll talk about this evening. All the way on the left, we start with phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is an understanding of the speech sounds of English. It's the ability for students to manipulate these sounds to be able to make them into words. This is a critically important part of literacy. And in fact, a lot of studies show that students who struggle with reading later in their career, this is the area that they have gaps. We have in our curriculum an explicit focus on developing phonemic awareness and understanding of those speech sounds, how they're formed and how they come together to make words. Phonics is the area of literacy that helps put those sounds to associate them with a symbol or a letter. So I mentioned we have phonemes, we have 44 sounds in the English language, but we only have 26 letters of the alphabet. And so what we teach our students is how these combinations of letters form together to make sounds to make words. We also focus on the pillar of fluency. This is how our students develop automaticity with these words and also understand what we call prosody, which means they understand how to read words with meaning, whether it's through dialogue or understanding tone or tenor when they're reading from a character's words, but also to do it with such automaticity that they're not stopping to decode every sound when they read a whole word. We also focus on the development of vocabulary. Vocabulary is simply the meaning of words. We work on our listening vocabulary, but also our spoken vocabulary. This is a foundational pillar as our students access text across the disciplines. So we have discipline or content specific vocabulary, as well as what we call academic vocabulary. And finally, the ultimate goal of reading is comprehension, to make meaning. We want our students to be able to fluently and automatically as skilled readers, pull together all of these skills to access the rigor of the standards in every course they take. Next slide. Tonight we're gonna to talk about the written, taught, and assessed curriculum. The written curriculum, and here I have some language excerpted from our policy in Rule 6000. The written curriculum serves at a minimum as the scope and sequence 
goals and objectives, assessments, sample instructional activities, and suggested resources. Our role in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction is to provide these resources for teachers where we define what is going to be taught. We do that through a document we'll call the Year at a Glance, and you'll see that in a few slides. I've also pulled out another area of Rule 6000, which talks about our obligation to ensure that our curriculum is culturally sensitive and equitably accessible to our teachers, students, and parents. This particular area of the policy and rule has been the driving force of a lot of the work that we've brought forward to this board in terms of adding new novels or new resources to ensure that we're providing that curriculum for our students. Next slide, please. Here you see an example of that year at a glance. This year in particular, we added to our curriculum documents resources to help our teachers understand how to accelerate. You'll hear us talk about learning acceleration. We know that our students faced unprecedented gaps in their teaching and learning opportunities due to the pandemic. What we know though from research is that we can't go backwards. We won't be able to address those gaps by going back to previous grade levels or courses. Instead, we have to help our teachers understand how to be surgically precise in understanding the most important standards to teach at that current grade level or current course. We have identified priority standards for reading information and literature as well as writing. They are identified on our year at a glance documents and they also help our teachers to understand how these standards build upon one another. So you'll see that in earlier units, what's identified as a priority standard will then serve as a foundation for standards in later units. We also identify targeted standards, which are then assessed in the end of unit assessments. When we talk about literacy in grades K through three, we have a huge focus on our open court. We're gonna talk more about open court this board, thanks to the generosity of the budget and the support that we have, I'm proud to say that we have open court in every classroom in K through grade three. This is a huge step in a positive direction for all of our students to have access to an evidence-based, high-quality instructional resource that supports those pillars of literacy that I mentioned earlier. But we also know that in addition to having systematic and explicit instruction in foundational skills, our students need opportunities to access complex text to address reading literature and reading information. Students in K through three do this through opportunities to read selections from our anthology series, as well as opportunities to read longer novels and chapter books to understand how these literature and informational standards are addressed. Next slide, please. We continue these efforts to support literacy in grades four through five. So while the primary grades have the instructional focus on those foundational skills, we continue to build on these skills as we introduce even more complex text. So students still need to work on building fluency and automaticity. They still look at units of sound and phonics, but now we do it at the morpheme level. Things like prefixes and suffixes and root words. We also wanna make sure that our students have an opportunity to see themselves in the novels that they read. And we provide opportunities for students to do that through some of the novels that you see pictured here. This provides students with the opportunity to do what Rudine Sims Bishop talked about as windows, mirrors, and sliding doors. So they can see themselves, but they can also have an opportunity to see the culture that is different than their own lived experience. Next slide, please. <coughs> So this visual helps to translate those pillars, and you can see those pillars are color-coded to reflect back to that first slide. How do we actually implement all of those pillars in a day-to-day -day instruction? So in our English language arts block, we have identified what we call core instructional components. This is universal in all of our classrooms as part of our written curriculum. We identify in the inner circle components including explicit instruction and foundational skills instruction, writer's workshop, and then opportunities for teachers to have shared learning in whole group, as well as differentiated small group instruction and meaningful independent work. Around the outside, you can see how those elements of core instruction reflect those critical pillars for literacy that we mentioned before. Next slide. 
I want to take a little bit of time on open court. Since we are talking about the foundation that is so critically important in elementary school, and because this is an effort that we have taken to ensure all of our students have access to this evidence-based, high-quality curriculum. We often talk about the need to have curriculum that is explicit and systematic. I want to unpack a little bit about what we mean by systematic. What you'll see here is that over the course of grades K through three, those skills listed down the left-hand side that support those pillars of instruction have a different level of priority as the grade levels build. So for example, in kindergarten, we begin with alphabetic knowledge and the alphabetic principle, understanding the names of letters and how those become a part of that sound symbol correspondence. A heavy emphasis is placed on that pillar of phonological and phonemic awareness. This is where we really help our students understand that our language is made up of units of sound. They begin to understand that sound symbol correspondence and how those letters come together to make words, and they start to develop that important skill of fluency to develop automaticity through things like sight words and opportunities to practice reading. Phonics and decoding, fluency, and then morphological awareness become the main focus in first and second grade. We spend a significant amount of our explicit and systematic instruction in grades one and grade two, building on that foundation of sounds and the sound symbol correspondence. This helps students not only decode text, but also to do what we call encoding, which is spelling. How do they take those sounds that they hear and actually use what they know about letters to write words and write sentences? By the end of first grade into second and third, we're building on those units of sounds into larger chunks that we call morphological awareness. Morphological awareness is because as a language in English, we spell by sound and by meaning. So some of our words come from other languages and the roots have meaning and that informs their spelling. So we build upon this progression of skills from kindergarten through first, second, and third, all with the goal of creating skilled and fluent readers. That way, when they move into intermediate grades of grade four and five, and then ultimately in secondary grades, they can use that skilled reading across all of the disciplines. Next slide, please. So what does this look like in a classroom? So our job in CNI is to provide that written curriculum and to also provide that support for instruction through professional learning. The taught curriculum is where that comes alive in a classroom. So as you all know, our classrooms are made up of students that have very different needs and teachers who learn about their students and their needs to make instructional decisions. On the right, you can see an illustration of how one of our schools takes those components of English language arts and turns it into a daily schedule for students. This is how our teachers take that written curriculum guidance where we have identified those priority standards, the systematic and explicit nature, and the high quality instructional materials, and they make those really important instructional decisions based on the students in front of them. This is an opportunity for them to make those instructional decisions using student data that's gathered through some of our formal assessments, which Ms. Kraft will talk about, but also through the informal opportunity of kid watching and kid listening in those classrooms. Next slide. Part of how we support the taught curriculum and support that implementation is through professional learning. This quote at the top is one of my favorites because it's really essential to all that we do as a division of curriculum and instruction. Informed teachers are our best insurance against reading failure. While programs are very helpful tools, programs don't teach, teachers do. And so I talk a lot in curriculum committee about my efforts to provide a solid resource for every teacher. I want every teacher to have those open core kits and I'm grateful that we're in a place that we have it. But the most important thing that we can give our students is a highly qualified, highly skilled teacher who's able to use those resources and what they know about their students to make those instructional decisions. To support that, we engage in a variety of professional learning opportunities reflected here on the screen. You'll see the DBQ project. That's where we start to expand our literacy into other content areas using primary and secondary source documents to explore history. We've talked a lot about our professional learning in letters, which is about how we teach our teachers about what's happening in the brain when our students learn to read. We've also talked about the importance of having ongoing training for fidelity of open court, 
understanding all of those components. Some of that professional learning is with our teachers and the reading specialist, but some of it is also with administrators, which I know Mr. Wilson will talk about, and how we train our administrators to identify that fidelity and support and coach teachers. And in the top right, you'll see us reference the idea of teaching with complex text. You're very familiar with the system improvement teams that Dr. Williams has formed. And the reading system improvement team has identified as a target goal the need for teachers to provide explicit instruction in accessing complex text. It can't be either or. Our students need explicit and systematic instruction in those foundational skills, and they need opportunity to imply them in complex text so that they understand those reading literature and reading informational standards. And so in order to make sure we're implementing that talk curriculum, we provide professional learning in both areas. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Kraft, who's going to pick up talking about the taught curriculum from the perspective of our parents and students at home. Ms. Kraft. All right, uh, next slide. So at the top there, you'll see RAS Plus, uh, which is um, a program we were able to purchase uh, for all students. Um, in September alone this year, we had students read uh, almost 220,000 books. Um, where they are able to select books that are of interest to them um, and contribute to their quality of reading. You can also access this resource at home and Mr. Wilson in a little bit is gonna tell you how you can get there if you have not seen it yet. Um, next, you'll see a student holding, um, very proudly holding up some writing. So when your students come home, they are probably going to be able to share with you in the ways that they're writing. Um, and you also see on the screen a rubric. So in addition to their writing, you can see the kind of feedback they're getting uh, about their writing in uh, the classroom. Uh, you'll see them reading in small groups. So you'll hear them talking about text, uh, novels, maybe it's a self-selected book, and maybe it's a teacher assigned book. Um, sometimes those novels will come home, just like the decodable you see on the screen, you might see some of those coming home too. Um, and then the last one, you'll see some more uh, student writing where they're creating some graphs and some additional writing. And so we always like to say, okay, so if this is what's being taught and implemented in the classroom, what are some of those um, artifacts that you might see at home? So those are just a few things that you might see and be able to talk to your child. But a great question to ask your student would be, what did you read today or what did you write about today? And that would be an entryway into what was happening into the classroom. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about the written and the taught curriculum, we'll talk about the final piece, which is the assessed curriculum. And all three of these pieces are essential in order to improve student achievement. And so when we think about the purposes of assessment in English language arts, it's really to monitor student progress in relation to grade level standards and provide information to teachers, parents, and students themselves. We also want to use those results to plan for and provide responsive instruction. So as we collect assessment data, and there's lots of ways to assess, and we'll talk about that in a minute, we want to be able to use that to really make a difference in the day-to-day -day instruction. And then we also use it as a reflective practice to examine what is working for our students individually and collectively, and maybe what isn't working and what needs to be refined and changed. And so all of those pieces are used together um, at the classroom level, as well as the district level, as we think about what we need to change within our curriculum and our own assessments. Next slide. So as Ms. Shea uh, referenced earlier, we talked a lot about acceleration um, and really understanding that um, during this pandemic that there has been some unfinished learning. And so for us to really accelerate student progress, we need to know where that unfinished learning is so that we can provide just-in-time support. And so what you'll see on the screen, moving from left to right, um, um, and Ms. Shea has talked about the open court curriculum. So the very first thing is you'll see how we assess where students are within open court. And so there is embedded diagnostic uh, assessment that is provided during the getting started unit that allows us to figure out were there some unfinished learning from the previous year so that we can do it within the instruction of this grade level. And so that gives us a piece of data. And so diagnostic information uh, helps teachers plan and accelerate instruction. 
In the middle, you'll see our BS, uh, BCPS curriculum. And so what we have provided for teachers are observational record sheets. And so this is an informal way for teachers to gather data on how students are doing in relation to those prioritized grade level standards. And so that they can figure out who might need some more support with text as they move through the curriculum. And finally, on the right side, you'll see our curriculum-based assessments, which can be used both formatively and summatively. And so we assess um, the priority standards, which is how we reorganized our year at a glance this year to accelerate instruction. But we also have targeted standards. And so that gives us information on a, a, a standard that will be coming up in a future unit so we know how they're doing and how we might be responsive to them as we approach those standards. Next slide. In addition to those assessments, we also have some other assessments that help us form a picture of how students are doing. Uh, so we have our map assessment, and you see a sample report there. And uh, uh, the measures of academic progress in reading help us know how a student is doing at a point in time, but it also lets us to look at growth over time. And so that is another piece of data we have for literacy. We also will be getting data from our curriculum-based assessments uh, that we can pro pull from Performance Matters and provide reports to parents and to teachers to be able to use to plan instruction. Um, the CAP, of course, we gave the, the early fall assessment. That will give us some additional information on how a student is doing in literacy. And finally, Dibbles, uh, which we just finished our fall administration window, this provides additional information, again, to provide in a complete profile, knowing that any one piece of data is not enough to tell us how students are doing. It's really by using multiple measures of data that we can begin to uh, form a picture of a student's literacy growth and progress over time. Next slide. So if you look at this chart and you think this is a complicated chart, you are absolutely right. It is a complicated <laughs> chart because making decisions about students' literacy growth and progress is complicated. And it requires a lot of information and it requires inform teachers using data literacy to say, what does this data mean for, the, for this student at this point in time? And so what you'll see is that we, oh, we start with benchmark screeners. And so some of our core screeners that we use are MAPR and Dibbles and K1. Um, and that gives us just at a point in time, how is a student doing? And if there is something that causes concern on that screener, then we will dig deeper and do some diagnostic assessment. Because remember, any one data point isn't going to drive a student into an intervention or say a student is not doing well. Um, at the very least, we're going to triangulate data and use a minimum of three data points before we determine a student is not doing well. And so once we do a second assessment, that will give us some additional information whether a student needs to have some additional support in a tier two or a tier three. And you've heard we spent probably 75% of our presentation at this point in the core instruction. Just like when we start to talk about a multi-tiered system of support, 75 to 80% of our students should meet grade level standards from core instruction alone. And so really we're talking about a small portion of students that should need additional support because when you have a strong core, that will drive everything else. And so you can see a little bit of that decision-making process in terms of what do we look at in terms of looking at a tier two, and then once a student is placed into an intervention, then how do we progress monitor and determine when a student either needs to get a more intensive intervention or is ready to exit out. And so we just wanted to show you that we do have a process that helps guide that. And just like for a student that might be struggling um, with literacy, if a student also comes in and already is meeting grade level standards, we use the same type of process to uh, determine acceleration and enrichment opportunities opportunities and say what opportunities are available to continue the student's growth from where they are. Next slide. So this slide helps us determine, after we've determined there is a need for some additional support in terms of a multi-tiered system of support, after that tier one is in place, 
what we can um, provide for our students. So on the right side of the triangle, you'll see those, that's our decoding side. And so for students that are struggling with decoding, uh, what types of interventions we would be able to offer at the tier two and tier three. And on the left side, you'll see those are our comprehension-based interventions that would uh, be able to be provided if we determine that it is a comprehension need. Going back to those five pillars that Ms. Shea talked about, we have to determine where the struggle is. We can't just say they're struggling in reading. We have to actually know what their need is so that we can match the intervention to their need. And so when we think about a multi-tiered system of support, we will make sure that there is a solid tier one in place, that there are evidence-based programs, so every program that is on that list has an evidence base behind it that it does accelerate student instruction and literacy, that there's ongoing assessment, and that we use data-based decision-making. And so that is what we do to ensure if we have done everything we need to do in core that a student is still not making adequate progress, how we can make sure that we diagnose and get them the support that they need so that we can eventually get them back into core instruction because they are meeting grade level benchmarks. We collaborated with ESOL and special education when we put together this comprehensive approach to supporting uh, striving readers. And so we really work as a uh, a really coordinated unit to make sure that we are providing comprehensive support for all of our students. Uh, and I am going to turn it over to Mr. Wilson now. Thank you, and we can go to the next slide as we uh, bring this presentation, uh, bring it on home. So so how do, we, how do we put all of this together, right? And I heard it tonight in some of the, uh, the uh, board testimony from some of our parents around, you know, we've got these great curriculum opportunities and, and resources, but how do we know what's happening in our schools? So that's what I'm gonna speak tonight. Uh, so as a, as a representative from my office in the Division of School Support and Achievement, um, we support principals directly and schools and work collaboratively with our partners in curriculum and instruction. So there's a variety of ways that we do it. So at the school level, the first thing, we need to make sure that a school team has a master schedule in place to provide for collaborative planning, which will give some of our teachers, and, and you heard, heard one speaking tonight, all of the different planning um, resources and challenges that come with learning a new curriculum. I need time with my colleagues to be able to do that during the school day, right? Not staying until nine o'clock at night. So having a master schedule that really allows for the collaborative planning of meeting the needs of all of our students at different levels. So that's, that's step number one. Uh, also at the school level, the professional uh, learning opportunities that Ms. Shea talked about. So uh, sometimes it's bringing all of our teachers together to learn about new challenges and, and new resources and, uh, and, and teaching opportunities. Other times it's bringing reading specialists together and it becomes a trainer of trainer model. So that would happen during a staff meeting or could happen during collaborative planning time. So just opportunities for teachers to gain more, more knowledge around some of these new curriculum uh, designs. Um, data analysis, all right, that's ongoing. And, and it's not just the district measures or the external measures, it's what did we plan for our children to learn today and how do we know we learned it? So those formative exit cards or those questions at the end of a lesson that a teacher will collect informally. And then how do we come together and talk about that as a grade level team to plan for the next day or the next week to make sure that those structures around formative data assessment and analysis are in place. Um, so those are, and, and all of this is, is aligned to our school progress planning. Uh, you heard Dr. Uh, Williams talk about uh, focus area number one and number two. All, all of that is aligned from the principal all the way down to the teacher to make sure that we're focused on instruction for all students. And then as we move to uh, central office supports. So, it, so it's our job to be out in schools. So myself, uh, our community superintendents, Dr. Williams himself, we do school visits. Mr. Thomas, we've been on some visits together. 
um, as well as some of the other board members. But, but we go out and we inspect to make sure that these things are happening. So we'll go in, we'll look at instruction, we'll ask questions of the principal, we need to see that all the elements of the curriculum are in place, um, that students are having opportunity for discourse, that the small group instruction is happening. And when it's not, then it's, it's conversations, right? We don't come down as a hammer, right? We use data and, and our walkthroughs are another informal tool to collect data. And we have a conversation with our principals and administrative teams about what can we do better in terms of implement, excuse me, implementation with fidelity of, of our curriculum. So walkthroughs is a great tool that we use on a variety of levels. Um, the instructional core team, that's a great uh, cross office collaboration that we use between uh, curriculum instruction, DSSA, special education, equity, where we come together and we focus on some of our most challenging schools around implementation of, of curriculum with fidelity. And we're talking about planning. We're talking about variability of instruction from classroom to classroom. We're talking about uh, some of these structures that may or may not be in place and what's needed, what supports are needed to the schools from our, from our lens to make sure that that happens. So, so we're providing that uh, intense support to uh, some of our most challenging schools through the ICT process. And then, um, and then you know, lastly, we'll talk about professional development for administrators. I think next week, um, our principals will be coming together talking about this idea of accelerated learning that uh, Ms. Kraft just talked about. And so that principals can get a deeper understanding around some of the challenges of our curriculum and what that means and what they should be looking for as administrators. And then we, as DSSAs, attend these uh, professional learning opportunities and then we, we have time for reflection with our principals. So based on what you heard, what are you gonna do? And when Dr. Williams and Dr. Robertson and myself come out, we want to see examples of that in, in, in action. And so uh, that, that's just an example of how all of this comes together from a standpoint of accountability, from a standpoint of support to our administrators, to our teachers, to our students. And then lastly, we can go to the next slide. Um, what about our parents? And um, I, we heard from uh, Mr. Ferrone this evening about uh, just some, some district opportunities that uh, he even mentioned Ms. Shea and some of her group coming out uh, to work with our families. But if you look on the uh, far uh, left, excuse me, right hand side, you know, it really starts at the school level. So uh, there's lots of resources that a parent can go to in terms of the classroom teacher. You know, how do I log into RAS? Or, you know, the school principal. You know, I need access to some of the, uh, the online tutoring and supports for my student in, in some of these curriculum uh, areas. The reading specialist, the media specialist. So there's lots of different school-based folks that can help our parents. That's the first step. And then again, you know, back to uh, at the district level, we've got Ms. Shea, we've got Ms. Kraft, we've got a variety of, of curriculum and instruction, rep instruction representatives that are at the ready to assist. And all, all a parent needs to do is reach out to one of them or reach out to a school and the school can reach out to one of them for more in-depth knowledge around some of these uh, questions that parents may have. And then lastly, if you look on the far right hand side, uh, there are a lot of county and national resources. Uh, we've got our public libraries that uh, help in terms of, you know, matching different texts and, and, and interests for our students, um, as well as um, MSDE and USDE that has just a variety of different resources for parents of how to support our students best in terms of literacy instruction. So I know we shared a lot of information and uh, this, can, Dr. Williams, this concludes our formal presentation. So uh, we'll turn it back over to you, sir. Well, first, let me, let me thank the team. Um, to the board, what are your goals? You know reading is important. They gave you the gestalt of everything at the elementary level. 
<laughs> because if they wanted to do K to 12, we will be here to midnight. <laughs> but the purpose of this is to establish the foundation mm -hmm. as we move through these other goals that you have identified that are aligned with our strategic plan. The other important part is the curriculum side just can't do it by itself. So you heard the written taught and assess. And what Mr. Wilson and other folks in DSSA do, they go out and they coach principals, they work with the leadership team. So we gave you a lot. We wanted to build that foundation because as we move forward with those goals and those areas that we're gonna talk about all year, you will have this foundation to draw from. So I, I wanna thank you all for the time and intention and trying to bring all of this information into a presentation tonight. tonight. So um, this is not one and done. As I, sh I shared, there's other topics we'll be coming back to the board as we, if, if you so desire, looking at secondary, looking at mathematics, you have your board goals. We've outlined those presentations for the year. So we thank you for your time. I guess if there are any comments, um, we'll be happy to take a few comments. I will say that if we are unable to respond to questions, we will follow up in a, a written form. Thank you. Thank you. And I have, um, I'm getting board members now. Um, Ms. Hen is first. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the outstanding presentation. This was just terrific. I really appreciate all the work that went into it, and at this late hour, uh, your energy and <laughs> enthusiasm are to be commended, so thank you very much. I just have one question, and you, you mentioned this. We heard from our public tonight um, the question about tracking and implementation, and my question is, um, if this were a billable service, everything above and beyond core curriculum, are we tracking at a student level the implementation and delivery of these services at a student level? So, for instance, um, is that something we can show? Is the implementation consistent? And do we have a mechanism or systems that allow us to, to track that at a student level? Sure, I can start. And colleagues, Thank if you, you. want to jump in, sure. So, um, you know, we talked about our, our walkthroughs that we use. So... Principals have um, curriculum look-fors, if you will, that are aligned to the different curriculum resources that we have. So they're using those resources, they're going in, and they're making sure that implementation is happening uh, with fidelity in all of the different classrooms. So using the curriculum look-for tools is one way that we do that. But then circling back to the teacher, because sometimes, you know, within planning, there may be some things that come up where, you know, implementation that day might have been different. So, you know, having that, that common planning time where administrators or reading specialists can go in and sort of ask some of those questions around, well, this is what I saw, is, is another way to get that teacher input and teacher voice around, you know, what supports they may need. But I would say using the um, walkthrough tools with the curriculum look fors is one way, and we do that across the district, east, east west, and central, um, to make sure that that's happening with fidelity. Thank you. So just to clarify, um, and the reason I use that analogy is because there's a higher accountability when, say, you're, you're billing for a service, right? If there were to become a federal grant source available tomorrow and they said, BCPS, we're going to provide you millions of dollars for these services and reimburse you mm -hmm. for this curriculum that you've purchased, and it's amazing, but you need to show us documentation that these students are receiving um, these supplemental um, supports. Mm -hmm. right. Could yeah. we show that for so, these students that are receiving it with fidelity? So thank you for that. Um, thank you. It, um, what I can tell you is part of the Ready to Read Act that we've talked about when we mentioned Dibbles as a screener, um, you know, in BCPS, we were already um, using that process, and then it became law that we, we needed to. Part of that does require us to now track and report how many students, when Ms. Kraft talked about that second level of needing supplemental instruction or needing an additional screener, we now are charged with tracking that, to use that phrase that you used, um, to be able to report on that. And so that has created an opportunity for us to 
to establish structures for exactly that. So if somebody wanted to give me millions of dollars tomorrow, I'd be poised <laughs> to expand that structure that we currently use with Dibbles um, at the elementary level so that we can report how many students did we have to move into tier two or tier three. That's not something that had been, um, it was happening in practice, but not something that we necessarily had the structures. But I, my answer now is yes, we are poised to be able to do that. Um, because we've established those structures based on dibbles that could be expanded. So that in combination with what Mr. Wilson talked about, that's really more at the programmatic level. Um, and we also have a process by which we, as we do those walkthrough tools, are identifying um, schools that are in need of support. So as Mr. Wilson said before, not as a hammer, but as a flashlight. So where it's not happening, why not? And what can we do to support that implementation, whether it's through additional professional learning or um, support from the office? That's great to hear because we want to tell the success stories. Yep. It's not yeah. a hammer. It's to say we've invested in these resources. Our county and state partners have invested in these amazing curriculum resources. Here are how many students benefit. Yep. That's a question this board should be able to answer for our, our taxpayers as well. Thank you. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Mr. Offerman. First of all, thank you for this very comprehensive report. And I would have hoped, and I know it's not true, that a large number of K through three parents would would be able to to actually to actually view this or at least get this information. Mm -hmm. I might make a suggestion that, and I know how busy everybody is, but someone might want to consider a pilot program to put a modified version of of this of this entire presentation together to to provide to uh, uh, you know uh, various school or even school clusters. Uh, parents are really interested in, in really understanding what's going on with reading. I, I would think this would be a really, a really good way to do it. Uh, parents, you know, I, 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 we have such a wide range of background that, that our parents have, but I think it might be worth considering that, or at least, at least on a trial basis, to see how much, how much reaction and how much interaction that we would get. And again, thank you. You, you all did a wonderful job. Thank you very much. If, if I may just make a comment to that, Mr. Offerman, many of our principals do curriculum nights and, res and um, events with their school community. And I have reached out and, and we're working with our local PTA to um, have information available for our schools. But many of our principals, every area we're trying to touch, and that's one area, and this is one example that many of our principals are, are doing either virtual, probably more than likely virtual because of the situation that they're in. But, but we talk about how do we inform and educate our, our parents, and a piece of this tonight was to talk about the, the resources for parents, but we're happy to continue down that road, so mm -hmm. thank you for Thank that. you. Thank you, and we'll go around. I have uh, Mrs. Pastor, Dr. Hager, um, Mr. Coon, Ms. Mack, and then Ms. Causey, and Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Well, certainly, I want to ditto what everyone has said. This was, um, was wonderful, and um, a lot of information here. And I really want to piggyback Mr. Offerman just beat me to saying it, that it is critical I, uh, that parents be exposed on different levels yeah. to this material so that they can be supportive or know which questions to ask mm -hmm. of teachers and administrators. Dr. Williams, you said many. I, I would like as a system for you to consider um, being able to share it so it's not many, but all. That's how we close the gaps, sure. you know, across our schools is making this uh, a part of our instructional policy, if you will, that these are the things, those curriculum nights, those kinds of sessions are um, things that all principals understand that on some level, they'll have their flexibility, but on some level they would do so. I saw you taking notes when Mr. Offerman <laughs> was speaking, so if you would just keep that um, in your minds as something as a possibility. but. Um, excellent. And at some point, I would like to see um, what happens when we move beyond these grades because we know yes. that often our students lose that traction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we wonder what happened and when they started falling behind. So if you will put Absolutely. that as a note as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. Um, I just have two uh, unrelated questions. The first is how long has Open Court been in place? That's a great question. Um, I'll start. Okay. So um, we actually started the pilot three years ago. Um, this is our first year of full implementation in every classroom K through three. So we've done a rollout where we did K-1 and then expanded it to two and three. So this is our first year of full implementation. In person. In person, right. Last year, I, I, you're right, you're correcting me. Last year we did start with the resources, but because it was virtual, this is our first year yeah. of full yes. implementation with the print materials in every classroom. And okay. because of that, we are um, providing additional job embedded mm -hmm. professional development, knowing that this is the first year where we're doing it in person, person. for that grade two, three band. Okay, I'm just thinking about tracking the, the impact of using yes. it, like, and I appreciate that you listed the standardized yes. tests and, and, and things sure. like that. So just thinking about how long that was in place. Um, the second question had to do with slide 17, which were the uh, supports that are in place, uh, the intense supports when implementation is not being met. And it seems to me, and perhaps I'm wrong, that the only human being support on this list is a reading specialist, but otherwise it's a lot of de professional development for the teacher and tracking for the teacher and helping the teacher plan. and to my limited knowledge on this topic, it seems like smaller groups and more people are probably a really good step in the right direction. <laughs> um, so just thinking, you know, budget season's right around the corner, kind of what, what is it that the board can do to help the teachers? They may know everything they need to know, but they just need more support. Sure. So that's something um, as we are developing the budget process, Dr. Hager will take that in consideration. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, next is Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. This is very informative. I really appreciate it. Um, Ms. Shea, you yeah. made a comment that I need to ask a question about. Okie doke. You said <laughs> when we're on grade level, we can't go back. Correct. Okay. So my concern with that, and, and hopefully you can clarify sure. for me, but my concern with that comment is if a student or child has, doesn't have the foundation yet and you're trying to move them or keep them in a grade a grade level that they may not they shouldn't be in or they aren't they haven't achieved yet what how does that work it seems illogical to me so thank you for the opportunity to clarify it's a great question what i was speaking about is that we can't wholesale based on last year's disruption think to ourselves for every fourth grader we're going to go all the way back and start at third grade the research doesn't support that. That's a really remediation mindset. What it does support is that at point of use in instruction, we identify those priority standards and that's where we scaffold those prior grade levels. So it's not that we never do it. So if I'm a fourth grade teacher, I'm going to start with the fourth grade standards and expectations. I'm gonna use my diagnostics to see which of my students need that prior grade level work. And I'm going to address that at point of use in the curriculum to scaffold them back to fourth grade, not instead of fourth grade, but go back to where they are and identify those necessary scaffolds to make sure the focus is on that grade level. So it's not that we ignore it. We certainly address it. We just don't wholesale. We didn't this year buy every fourth grade teacher a third grade kit because that's not supported by research. That just widens the gap because then now they're in fourth grade and haven't had fourth grade curriculum. So that's what I was referencing. Okay, Hope thanks. That helps. Um, sure. So uh, slide 15 kind of talks about how you assess a child and where they are. Um, and I'm guessing that this goes hand in hand with what you just talked about, right? Yes, sir. And what we added this year is because um, that frame that Ms. Kraft talked about, that it is just that hard <laughs> in making those decisions, that's always true. This particular year, we know that more students may show up that way because of that significant disruption. So in addition to that approach that's very student-centered, we also took a curricular approach where in the curriculum we said, these are the most important standards, so don't go back and redo everything. Mm -hmm. Be really strategic and surgically precise in identifying what maybe the majority of your students will need because of that significant um, interruption that we had and that unfinished learning as a result. So it's a both and in particular this year. Great, thank you. Sure. Last question. Slide four says reading reading literature and writing. So when we look at your um, slide 16 with the tiered reading support, reading and writing usually goes hand in hand. Um, where 
does does this cover any writing um, curriculum that we have, or is it somehow merged together somewhere in here and not called out? So um, in t two instances, and then certainly Ms. Kraft, yeah, I'll sure. invite you if you want to chime in. Um, yes, the curriculum does identify. So everything I talked about in terms of priority standards and opportunities for um, acceleration, that does apply to writing. The particular um, model of assessment-driven instruction that Ms. Kraft walked through with the diagram, those screeners that are referenced that are the starting point, they are specifically are referencing reading screeners. So that's why you don't see writing reflected on that oh, diagram. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on the next slide. Okay. 16 <laughs> with your... Your oh, nice the tiers, yes. Triangle. So, so that was specific right. to reading support. Okay. So, okay. Um, that is why you see those programs. So, do we have a writing one? So, that's what we're working on now. So, okay. writing right now, our focus has been on tier one in the core. Yes. We actually have been putting out for um, our request for information, looking for additional resources for a tiered approach to support students that need supplemental writing instruction as well. Ms. Kraft, is there anything you want to add that I missed? Yeah, so we're collaborating with Special Education and ESOL again to work on this request for information for writing. Uh, but uh, like Ms. Shea said, we have to first have a very strong core in place. And so we were making sure that the written instruction in our core curriculum was in place at the same time as we are working on a request for information for writing interventions. And so it's a both and. Um, so we got the reading in place and we feel really good about that. And now we're moving our attention to that writing strand. So we're, we do not have a triangle like that yet, but it will be coming. <laughs> Um, and I did want to just add on one thing when we were talking about the acceleration that the standards themselves provide this beautiful spiraling. So when we talk about we can't go back, the way that they build upon each other in each grade level allows for us to already have a foundation and a standard, whether we're looking at main idea or you know any of the standards, so that we say, okay, so here's what we did in third grade and here's the complexity we're adding in fourth grade and here's the complexity we're adding in fifth grade. And so that's why we're not gonna go back and teach because what we're gonna be able to do is anchor it in the standard that's appearing then and just figure out do they just need to add this piece to it. And so we really have this beautiful framework to really be able to accelerate that instruction. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mack. First of all, thank you, um, all of you, Dr. McComas and the entire team. I've seen a lot of this before, but um, I always find it fascinating. And I'd like to thank you for your continued efforts to procure evidence-based materials. And I'm going to sound like a broken record with what I'm about to ask, but um, we have purchased a lot of evidence-based materials this year, and 10 of them have to do with reading, and I appreciate that, but I am very concerned that we have not, we don't have the time built in to train the very people who are delivering these interventions. For example, on slides 16 and 17, we talk about tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions. Um, in the letters contract from 2016, it indicated that 2,500 K through two teachers would complete all of the modules for um, letters. I talk to teachers all the time who still have not received it. So I guess my question is, are we tracking how many of our teachers are trained, fully trained in each one of these interventions? Um, SIPS is um, a tier two intervention for grades three and five have all of the teachers in three to five who teach reading, have they received the full SIPS training? And then finally, in tier three, Orton-Gillingham, which I understand requires 60 hours of training, when teachers only have maybe two days the week before school goes back, or one hour a week with their principal, how are teachers getting these trainings or this professional development? Because we can continue to buy it, but unless we give it to our teachers to give to our students, it's not going to help us move the needle. So let me respond to that, Ms. Matt. Thank you so much. That's why we have focus area one, learning, accountability, and results. Mm -hmm. Then we have focus area two, uh, three, about the high-performing workforce. And I have charged the organization effectiveness to develop a year-long professional development. Mm -hmm. I have to remind the board, we are still in a pandemic. Teachers are still covering. We have a staffing shortage. So, so to then 
demand and require for staff to participate in professional development on top of other responsibilities, I would say we, we, we're gonna have to go a little slow to then get, go fast. So I, I agree with you. We have the resources. Our staff have to have the time, mm -hmm. our school-based staff, our central office staff. But we're, we are still rebuilding, we're healing, we're trying to work with uh, our families. So, so I agree with you, we're gonna, we're gonna monitor. I wanna change our terminology and not say track. I have a, a reaction yeah. to that personally. <laughs> I would say we wanna monitor not only what we're doing with our staff, but how our students are doing. Yes. Uh, to say that those resources are really making a difference. So I agree with you. We have the resources. We now have to look at what's happening in the schools and what we can do to make sure our staff members are really taking advantage of that professional development. So stay tuned to that. I think each presentation will be sharing that as well as our year-long plan uh, around data literacy, acceleration, a standard of excellence, and our social emotional learning and, and well being. So I appreciate that point. Thank you for that information mm -hmm. and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Colsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I did just want to, uh, what I pulled out was the Board of Education two year goals, which is aligned with the focus areas within the compass, our pathway to excellence, and focus area number one is learning, accountability, and results. Obviously, that is what we're, that we care about. Um, so I had several questions, and I'm just gonna spit them all out, and then you all can <laughs> take your time answering mm -hmm. them or, or respond later. Um, so in terms of uh, the most important standards are being selected, I'm uh, interested in understanding how, um, how that selection is done and how that aligns with the MSDE guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, it was also stated that the strong core instruction should allow 75 to 80% of students to uh, reach proficiency with only that core instruction. And I'm understanding this is new um, implementation, but how does that align with proficiency results from before the pandemic where we were not reaching those proficiency levels? Um, it was also stated that there were three data points um, required before in intervention. How long does that take from the beginning of a school year for a teacher with a student they haven't had before? Um, and um, how long does that actually take? Um, because we've heard reports of students not being identified as struggling early enough to receive those interventions in a timely fashion. Um, and then in terms of the master schedule for collaborative planning in each school, which goes back to the uh, opportunity for professional development within the workday for our staff, how is that done? And I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Okay, team, I'll take one and then okay. yeah. <laughs> take your pick. You have a choice. Um, so I'm going to go to the first one. Your question about the priority standards is a great question. So that process is done um, through multiple ways. Um, first, we do have national partners. So organizations like Achieve the Core um, have done some of that work for us. So they have looked, and one of the ways they define priority standards is about utility. So that uh, recurrence that um, Ms. Kraft talked about where standards spiral back. If a standard is gonna spiral back again and again and again, it's a priority because we know that if the student has a gap in that standard, it's gonna impact them in this unit and five more as well as subsequent years. Um, so we look to national and state partners, um, including MSCE. We also look at the um, cross-curricular connection. So when we're looking at a standard that has um, the opportunity to spiral not only within the ELA curriculum, but also provide that foundation of um, learning across science and across social studies, that can also become a priority standard. So um, we worked as a team. We look at vertical team planning to understand those priority standards as they move through the grade levels. Um, and then we also worked as a team to say last year, part of our um, strategy, if you will, our response to the um, shutdown was to narrow the scope and sequence you'll remember from last year. So we talked about, okay, when we did that narrowing, what gap did we maybe create in our curriculum that we need to address by identifying it as a priority standard? And then of course that alignment to the assessment can also drive that. So there's multiple ways. Um, the core instruction pyramid, I'm, I, Ms. Kraft can speak to this, but um, 
what she talked about was statistically, that's what we should see when we see a pyramid inverted. In other words, where we see far too many students identifying as needing intervention, it might seem like our reaction is to add more interventions, but what research will tell us is it means we need to focus on the core. So some of what you described is exactly why we've spent so much time on that core and identifying those evidence-based resources so that we can align with what research tells us should be the case. Do you want to talk about the multiple data points? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to add on to what you sure. just said too. So. Um, one of the reasons when we look at the compass and we talk about the new implementation um, of open in curricula and in, in ELA, of course, that's open court, um, we identified that our pyramid wasn't looking the way we wanted it to look, right? And so we said, what is it that we need in core? And um, I'm always very grateful that we had the money to invest in that open court. And so just thinking about the timeline of that, so K-1, so if we take away the pilot year for a second, because we wanted to say first, did it work, right? So full implementation for K-1 was 2019-2020, and then during the pandemic, we continued with 2-3. I mean, I, you know, I want to be realistic. Like, yes, we did 2-3 last year, but we were in the middle of a pandemic and there was less time to learn and there were lots of things going on. So I like to say our first full implementation of K-3 in person, I qualify, is this year. So when we will start to see that is when we start to see that implementation really taking root. And so we should start to see that data following, knowing that we have implemented something that is evidence-based, that has a research base behind it, and that we will start to see that data shift. But right now, you're right, our data doesn't look like that. And we knew we needed to do something different, hence that priority in the compass. Um, so about the triangulation of data, and, um, and I always like to say a minimum of three because certainly there's lots and lots of data points that we'd like to, to use because any one data point given in time does not give us a, a complete picture. Um, and so when we think about that, um, remember that in September we administer MAP and reading, um, and in K-1 we administer Dibbles. So right there we have a data point. And uh, just like when we, you know, somebody says they're sick and we take their temperature and we're like, oh, they have a fever, um, we don't know what's causing that fever. So like we might get something and say, oh, we know something's wrong, but we don't know exactly what. And that's when I was saying, okay, now we need to move on to some other data points. We, we sense that there is um, something at risk here, whether it's a medium or high risk. What do we need to, what additional information do we need to make that determination? Um, and so there's this fine line between like being like, oh, there's a problem right away. Like maybe they haven't even just gotten accustomed to being back in school, right? Versus like waiting till April and saying, oh, I think there's a problem. And so I think that there's, there's not this, you know, I think that you want to make sure that you're balancing the amount of time with also being timely. And so um, I think those data points come pretty quickly because they're not all have to be those standardized, right? So we have all these curriculum-based measures plus what the teachers do every day when they observe students. And so as we start to see some patterns and trends that indicate that the student is struggling with grade level standards, that's when we want to start to put some additional support in place. And actually the very first thing we're going to do is give them additional core instruction. We're not going to immediately move them into an intervention. We're going to say, do they need it in a smaller group? Do they need more of it? Do they need it at a different time of day? And so we will look at lots of different things that could potentially happen before we say, okay, we need to move them into an intervention. And in terms of the master schedule, so you have your specials, so you have art, music, PE, and media. And so if you're grouping grade levels to attend those specials at the same time, then that means all your fifth grade teachers can be off at the same time. And so not every day are we going to come together and plan. I mean, there's a lot to do, right, in terms of this. Um, there's individual time that they'll have, but, you know, Surely one to two times a week, we have to come together. We have to talk about how do we scaffold, how do we back map, and all of the essential pieces. So really using the specialist schedule to do that. And some principals get really creative, and they back it up to arrival and dismissal, mm -hmm. and they add an extra day of. So, you know, so there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. So, and so it's really elevating what some of these principals are doing, and how can we do it at at school, or how can we do it at this school? But it's the special schedule that drives it. That's great, thank you for all that. And my, my last quick question is, um, when you go visit BCPS schools and you go into the gyms, they have these wonderful posters with pictures of a brain. 
here's a picture of a brain. It's got some colors in, in it. And then here's another picture of a brain. It's got a lot more colors. It's more vibrant. And it's your brain after exercise. So we've talked about um, the importance of exercise. How are we making sure that our children with all this intensity are still getting that recess time or that play time that then ultimately increases their achievement? So I can add really quickly to but that. I'll just, I'll oh, just say sorry, we build it in the schedule. Right. And the, the, the principles <laughs> are very creative to making yeah. it work as we are transitioning all students back in person this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Next is Ms. Rowe. So I have a couple questions. Um, I remember when my oldest daughter did open court here in this school system. And I remember when one of my younger ones didn't do open court. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, are, are we gonna stay with this now? <laughs> because <laughs> it seems to really work. Right. And the thing that we did in the interim was not as well appreciated. <laughs> and um, the other thought that I had was, is there a way for us to use ESSER money to create an incentive for teachers to get some additional training on their own, to be able to pay them to get training either in the summer or because we have, there's a lot of things. It seems like almost everything that we buy in instructional materials comes along with well, this is only gonna work if we have professional development. And I'm thinking you tally that up, there's not enough hours in the day to provide enough professional development to make every single thing we purchase as effective as it could be. And if we create an incentive for teachers and staff to get training on their own in the summer by paying them, is there grant money for that? So I will respond the first question, we're hoping to stick with open court mm -hmm. based on the research and the data. Yes. yes. That's, that's one thing. Number two, um, I really, it goes back to what Ms. Mack asked about the time for, for our staff to do the training. And it's the implementation of our curriculum and that coaching and monitoring. So uh, when I start to prepare my, my budget. Um, you'll hear a little bit around professional development. I think I've said that day one when I came mm -hmm. about building that capacity. <clears throat> so yes, we're looking at ways, um, you call it incentive. We just giving folks that opportunity to be a part of professional development, but there's more than just that is the implementation, is the monitoring, is the feedback, is the coaching that 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 need to happen. So, uh, I thank you for that, Ms. Rowe. I think we we're going to continue to look at, and this is just reading. <laughs> <laughs> it's reading, and you know every teacher has to have that the the six credits of reading mm -hmm. to teach in Maryland. I think it's six credits. Mm -hmm. HR will correct me if I'm wrong. So it's, it's very important that the foundation is that every teacher has some aspect of reading and our elementary, that's a part of the certification. A quick follow-up question. Do they teach open court in college? No, so part of our efforts, we, we need support um, with, and we talked a lot about this at the curriculum committee, we need to change that uh, teacher prep program on how they're teaching teachers to prepare for reading. Part of our letters is because we're filling in gaps mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. teachers yes. from day one. So it is a need. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We do partner with our higher ed, so. All right, it looks like we have a question from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Actually, a lot of my questions were asked, but I just wanna thank you, Dr. Williams, Dr. McCombs, Ms. Ms. Shea, Ms. Kraft, and Mr. Wilson for the presentation. I have a couple of quick uh, observations. I'm a huge proponent of STEM, as you know, as an engineer, but I also realize and reckon that if you can't read, you can't do math. Mm -hmm. So uh, you keep referencing evidence-based research, mm -hmm. and I've read the reading research is well established, but are there reading practices still used that have been debunked by cognitive scientists that we're still using, and how are we going to make sure our teachers unlearn those practices because we keep hearing about professional development and how um, 
time strapped our teachers are. So how are we taking that into account and how are we also making sure that some of the content you share, which I think is great, uh, it's preparing our children for the 21st century global uh, environment uh, with the sensitivity, objectivity, and cultural nuances that are needed to teach those mm -hmm. in a, um, you know, in a very teachable manner. So w what are we doing about that? Thank you again. Of course. So um, I'll start the first one. Part of why um, we are so focused on evidence-based resources is because they've then done the thinking of those practices for teachers. So we talked a lot about, and I meant to, act, you gave me an opportunity to mention something. We talk a lot about instructional decision-making and how teachers make different decisions with the written curriculum. Open Court's an area where we want them to stay right on page. We actually don't want them making different decisions because of exactly what you just described. By choosing an evidence-based resource, we can ensure that those practices are laid out right there for teachers. There's a deliberateness to how those um, specific routines are built in the teaching. So rather than having to have it be a separate professional learning, by staying with open court and following that explicit and systematic scope and sequence, we are actually training teachers in those research-based practices. So it's a way to kind of double dip, if you will, in having those resources when we implement them with fidelity. Um, the second question that you talked about in terms of how are we supporting teachers, again, I'm gonna talk about professional learning mm -hmm. um, because there's just no getting around it. The informed teacher is the best tool that we have. There's no, there's no changing that. Um, Ms. Craft and team work really closely with our, this is an area where we leverage our reading specialists mm -hmm. that Mr. Wilson mentioned. So we do a lot with our reading specialists about how they in the building can coach teachers around if we've identified a new novel, if we have a new topic, how are you doing it in a way that's um, culturally respectful and sustaining for our students? Um, and how do we do that through conversation and collaboration using some of those structures that Mr. Wilson talked about? We build resources into the curriculum to help teachers with that at point of use, but the best efforts come through those opportunities for collaboration. Um, we primarily support that through our reading specialists because that's a smaller group we can pull from schools uh, to create a cohort of leaders in every building that can support teachers with that. Thank you. So is your small groups the same as your reading intervention? So is that the second tier that would go into if the small groups don't? So it's a great question. Um, I would say see all of the above. So we use small groups for a variety of reasons. We use small groups just to be just that. So more students have an opportunity to talk. More students have an opportunity to participate. Um, and we use um, small groups for acceleration and enrichment for students that maybe need an opportunity to do something more challenging. And we use small groups for the purpose of a specific intervention tasked to align with that identified need. Thank you for that. Um, and I would just like to say, because I haven't spoke yet, that I found this very informative, um, very, very specific. Um, I'm looking, I think it's page 16, even the Orton Gillingham Wilson reading system. I mean, I think that's, um, very, those things are, are very important. And so um, at this point, I, my questions have, have been asked, but I felt that your presentation was very thorough. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, again, I want to thank the team. I want to correct something I said. Elementary and early childhood teachers must have 12 credit hours in reading and <laughs> secondary <laughs> six. I'm going to correct that. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it looks like the next item on the agenda is the update on the efficiency review. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. All right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I wanna present update, update number two of a clear path forward, our system plan to address the needs outlined in the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review. Our plan will be aligned with the blueprint for Maryland's future and with the goal of positioning Baltimore County Public Schools as a premier school system. My goal is to provide an overview of the process in general timeline for assessing, adopting, and implementing recommendations outlined in the 759 page report. Uh, my team and I regularly, will regularly update the board, our community and team VCPS are doing this time of change. Our partnership is critical to ensuring high quality services to our students, staff, and families of Baltimore County. Next slide, please. 
You heard about this earlier today. The Compass, our strategic plan, identifies the five priorities. Highlighted here on this slide are the two main areas of focus in the Operational Efficiency Review Report. Our primary focus is on learning, accountability, and results. This report, the uh, Efficiency Report, asserts the implementation of recommended efficiencies will enhance operational excellence, better serve schools, and result in improved academic outcomes for students. BCPS is using the survey results in the report to create a comprehensive plan that addresses climate, work environment, and morale. Staff are in the process of drafting a multifaceted plan focused on engagement, wellness, and appreciation in collaboration with our union partners and with the input of nine represented staff. The efficiency report also recommends the development and implementation of a written strategic communication plan that enhances transparency. Our communication team is currently leading an in-depth review of our methods and will solicit stakeholder feedback regarding preference, experience, and gaps in order to assess effectiveness. These data will be used to create a plan that increases inclusivity, efficiency, and clarity. Next slide. So as the leader, I recognize that this is a difficult time for central office staff who have devoted their energy, commitment, and professional careers to Baltimore County Public Schools. I would not have chosen to engage in a central office reorganization in the beginning of, school year, of a school year in the midst of a pandemic. However, I have the responsibility to address the concerns outlined in this report. Despite this challenging time, our number one goal has to be continuity of service to our school communities. As professionals, we will continue to be responsive during this time of transition. The way that we go about doing this work with careful attention to precision, transparency, and compassion will help us to move forward in rebuilding. Next slide. So the report contains three types of recommendations. Process and efficiencies, Board of Education policies, and personnel recommendations that refer to staffing and budget-related decisions. Thank you. The process that I'm about to outline speaks to the 157 recommendations directly related to proposed efficiencies. Recommendations regarding board policies will be sent to the Policy Review Committee. The remaining recommendations will be considered based on an in-depth analysis of the survey data, student outcome data, and review of peer districts with an eye towards balancing cost savings and high-quality service to schools in alignment with student needs and our strategic plan, the COMPASS. The next slide. So as we move through this process, we will apply a balanced and study approach for successful implementation. This slide shows the three types of groups that will be involved in reviewing and assessing the recommendations in each chapter. Division work groups will be, uh, their work will be to review recommendations, identify priorities, and chart a course for implementation of next steps. The Blueprint Review Team will review and uh, receive recommendations from division work groups to ensure alignment with the Blueprint for Maryland's Future for possible revisions and upgrades. And the Stakeholder Work Group will be tasked with identifying the desired end-user experience. This will uh, provide an opportunity for recommendations from division work groups and provide feedback um, by the stakeholder work group. Next slide. Each division work group will be assigned to one or more chapters of the report. An equity specialist and division executive director will co-facilitate meetings with a representative group of staff from the division and union representatives. Our blueprint review team will be co-led by division executive director and director Membership includes division staff in positions related to blueprint implementation and union representatives. And our stakeholder work group will be co-led by the division executive director and director. Membership will consist of representatives from all unions, PTSA, other board stakeholder parent groups, and SGA student councils. All work groups include an administrative professional. So, Next slide. The guiding question for the division work groups is, 
can we implement the recommendation as written? The options are yes, which prompt them to identify next steps in a timeline. Yes, with modifications, which necessitate identification of the modifications, next steps, and a timeline. Or no, with rationale and supporting evidence. It is important to note that the overall rate of implementation for efficiency review recommendations from Public Works LLC averages 80% across school districts. To ensure integrity of the process, it is important that we thoroughly vet each recommendation. Next slide. The blueprint review team is solely focused on recommendations related to the blueprint for Maryland's future. Recommendations from division work groups that are in alignment with the blueprint will move forward to the stakeholder work group. If a recommendation is not in alignment, it will be returned to the division work group with feedback and suggested revisions. Next slide. And our stakeholder work group members are charged with evaluating the end user experience. They will consider alignment with identified needs and share feedback regarding missed opportunities. Recommendations identified as aligned with needs will move forward. Missed opportunities will return to the division work groups for refinement or additional context as appropriate. Public Works has examined BCPS through the lens of savings and efficiencies. We must now make this work our own through a balance and study approach. The goal in this process is to ensure that all voices are heard and recommendations are reviewed through multiple lenses. Work group meetings begin this week. Agendas and action minutes will be shared and archived on our website. By the end of this process, each rec recommendation will be thoroughly vetted and a summary document reflecting both the process and outcomes will be created and posted. Division work group timelines are directly related to the number of recommendations. The recommended timeline for the earliest implementation is in the report is October through December of 2021. However, our immediate next steps are governed by the Board of Education policies and superintendent rules, as well as budget cycles. Recognizing that this is a difficult time for staff, I met with central office staff last week to keep them apprised of where we are in the process, share our next steps, and to reassure them of how deeply valued their work is in BCPS. So as I shared, our goal is to ensure continuity of services, address inefficiencies, and enhance supports to schools by reducing layers on cabinet. Last month, I shared our plan to reduce the number of direct reports to the superintendent from the current 11 to 7 in, in accordance with the recommendation from Public Works LLC and the analysis of peer districts. So the positions on this slide, Deputy Superintendent, Chief Financial Officer, and Chief Information Office, Officer represent the next level of work. Our work was critical before, but the circumstances of our global pandemic further demonstrate just how urgent this work is as we, sh as we strive to raise the bar, close the gap, and prepare Team BCPS for the future. With board support, uh, we will move forward with the posting of these positions and beginning the work of rebuilding. And the last slide, thank you for your continued support and we will continue to update the board, our community and team BCBS during these changing times. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams for the update. Okay, it looks like the next item on the agenda are so apologies. I'm, yes. So at this time, I'm requesting uh, for the board for me to move forward with the posting of these three positions that were in the next to the last slide. So moved. Can row. we? Sorry. So moved. Row second hand. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? Yes, Dr. Hager, and then Ms. Causey. So are these the only three cabinet members or will there be other cabinet members when, with the final? These chart? are the only three cabinet level members. New or total? That's not total. Oh, <laughs> new, new. Right, there was the total will be seven. That's what I thought. Yes, okay, thank yes, you. Thank you. I had to think about that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. 
for that clarification. Yes, Ms. Ms. Causey. in the public thank you is the job description as presented in the public works recommendations document they provided samples for us to um, look at and we have been looking at it with HR uh, we will be finalizing that once I get board approval to then move with posting of these positions okay and um, when will the board be provided those job descriptions when I get approval from the board, I'm happy to circle back. N the next board meeting is, is an update, I believe, maybe from um, the board side of the efficiency. So sometimes, It is, November 9th. Sometimes between November 9th and the following board meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Your so request is to see the board, the job descriptions. Let me make sure I understand yes. what you're asking for. Can we, yes. see them, can we see them in a weekly update or do we need to see them at a board meeting? Is that a thing? Oh, I can provide it in a weekly I'm just thinking it's expediting things. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Is there a reason the job descriptions can't be provided um, in board docs so that the public can see them as well? Are they confidential? Um, let me follow up with legal and HR on that. I, I have some questions, but I don't see why not. Okay. My preference would be for them to be made available to the public as well. So let's do this. Let me make it available to the board and give me some time to follow up with legal and HR. And if we can. Great. That seems to be a desire of the board. So let Thanks. me work through the, the, those who keep us out of trouble. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion has been made to accept it and it's been seconded. Um, Ms. Gober, may we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yes, Ms. Causey. We can't hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I, I'm still thinking I'm, you know, remote. Anyway, um, in terms of the, um, and thank you for preparing that report for us. In terms of the timeline of the work groups and um, the work that they're doing, how does that, how does that align with the public works recommended timelines? Well, it's, it's a line, but I, I made a comment. We have to make this report our own. So um, we're gonna look at that timeline. We may have to amend some of the recommendations and they're just strictly recommendations. Um, but um, we really, I wanna make sure that the, those division work groups, all those work groups are working and providing some recommendations again to make this our own and what we can do or what we need to modify or maybe we just can't do at this time thank you it looks like the next item on the agenda is um well, actually we've already done that the next item now is um our information items which include the quarter one audit report and the minutes from the September meeting of the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council. And these are information items. After that, the next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda items for future board meetings. And we will start first with Ms. Rowe. I have no comment at this time. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, in the literacy presentation, 
it was such an important statement. Informed teachers are our best insurance against reading failure. While programs are very helpful tools, programs don't teach, teachers do. And as we heard from um, our number of stakeholders and as we know with all of the issues that are processed um, through the Board of Education and through the superintendent and the administration, we know that it does take all manner of employees to support those teachers in the classroom, whether it's getting the children to school, supporting by being that um, paraeducator, um, the instructional core team, the principals. So the, it's very important. And I do uh, want to say to all of the stakeholders regarding public works, uh, excuse me, regarding um, public comment, to all the stakeholders, bargaining unit representatives, area advisory chairs, and public commenters, thank you for coming to speak to the board. I believe it's very important and I believe that we should work towards responses from the board that are not only internal but are also external. So as we work through our operational recommendations, hopefully that can uh, take place. The other issue is um, the calendar uh, vote is going to be coming up and I'm wondering if there has been any use of um, our internal draw office to seek input from students, teachers, staff, and parents. It's a mission critical issue. Uh, also, 30, 30, 30 seconds. Thank you. Also, uh, one of the recommendations in public works was to improve employee morale, and I think seeking their um, direct input on something so important could be helpful uh, to the board. Um, also, in terms of transparency and accountability, there's been requests about the high school schedule evaluation by parents, community members. Uh, information has been requested uh, since February, then in June, and then again recently. Um, and so I would like to hear that uh, feedback. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mack. I have no future agenda items. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. McMillian. Listen up. The audit committee meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, November 16th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. The next building and contracts committee meeting is Monday, November 8th, virtually at 4.30. Kudos to Dr. Mary McComas, Dr. Bo Mary Boswell McComas, I'll slow down a little bit, Ms. Jennifer Kraft, Ms. Megan Shea, and Mr. Eric Wilson. You must be very, very proud of your team for putting that together. And it's very evident that all of them are masters of their topic. Okay. Lastly, I'm going to say, I said this last meeting, I'm going to repeat it in a slightly different way until I'm positive that I'm being heard. Obviously, we are in a crisis and, rec and, and a recruitment and retention crisis. That being said, we must cherish, and yes, I chose the word cherish. I looked it up to make sure I had the right word. Protect and care lovingly all of our current 17,000 plus workers who come to work every day and do their jobs. We cannot continue to overwork the people that come to work every day and do their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Joes. Looks like she's left. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Board Budget Committee met on October 20th. Um, excellent presentation by Mr. Tantliff, supported by Mr. Saris. Encourage everyone to watch it. The next meeting of the Budget Committee is November 17th. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, there was an amazing Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee meeting that was held a few weeks ago that I was honored to be the Vice Chair for Ms. Pastor in. And uh, I, I I am excited to see some of the legislative priorities for this year come forward to the full board. Um, also, I would like to see um, some report or update to the board about our special education facilities in BCPS. At the MAVE conference, I attended a um, station with the Maryland Association of Non-Public Special Education Facilities. And I actually met with one of their directors today and learned about the special education Baltimore County Public School students that we have in some of the schools there uh, throughout their system. And I, I'd like to learn more about uh, that it's MANSEF um, and our special education facilities here in house that we have to offer to our students. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Offerman. Uh, just to repeat what I think I said two weeks ago, I'd like to look, like to see some prior presentation in some reasonably reasonable time period about about violence in the school in terms of a quantitative analysis compared to compared to previous years. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next is. Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. 
for my comments. <laughs> but you are the vice chair. So to the board members, we are putting together, as Mr. McMillian said, listen up. We are putting together our pri legislative priorities to get to the General Assembly. So I need it. I need whatever you want to put on that list or suggest to put on the list uh, by the next meeting. I will be sending out what we have already as a committee put together and some of that is a compilation of things we from last year and things that we'll find on May. But if you have some things that you want us to consider as a board, please get it to me as soon as possible so as a board you can see the total list of what we have put together. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, my only suggestion, I just wanna thank Dr. Williams for the way he's gone through the efficiency audit. I really appreciate kind of the, the stepwise approach. I'd love to see something like that for the blueprint when the time comes, taking the same approach. I just think it's been a really nice breakdown of kind of what we've done, what we're doing, kind of step by step along the way. The more I hear about the blueprint, the more excited I get. So um, I know we're, we're getting there, right? <laughs> it's because I sit next to her, so. Great, thank you. Next is Mr. Kuhn. Okay, I'll pass, thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, I will just give a brief update. We had the policy and review committee meeting October 18th. And we, um, at that meeting, reviewed um, policy 8311 meetings, policy 8314 meetings agenda, and 8601 use of social media. The next policy and review committee meeting will be November 15th, 2021. We also um, had the equity committee meeting where we looked at and um, approved our equity resolution and poster. And we are taking next steps with that. We looked at and reviewed it through the MABE equity lens and um, had a discussion about applying the equity lens system-wide through BCPS as we make our decisions um, based around everything um, that we do. So we also talked about um, our equity council that is forming and we will have next steps and follow up on that. Um, our next meeting for the equity council is no Thursday, November 18th. So, um, and also as the efficiency review goes, the one that the portion that had suggestions for the board, um, there will be a presentation on November 9th with um, the next steps in how we are um, uh, implementing uh, some of those suggested changes um, from the board level. So we're working in connection um, with the system so that we are both improving. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now that brings us to the last item on the agenda announcements. The board's next meeting will be held Tuesday, November 9th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us, and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>